everybody, welcome to another Comic Source Comic Boom collaboration. This is your DC Spotlight for February 28th, 2023. Big week of books. I think there's like 15, 14, 15 single books coming out this week. Uh, lots to talk about. Some good, some not so good. Um, but yeah, there's been a lot of news coming out of DC lately. And it's not, I, I mean, I, I don't want to be one of those guys, hey, the sky is falling and that sort of thing. But sometimes it feels like there's less and less to be excited about. Um, and I don't know if a lot of you guys heard about it, but Dan Didio did an interview this last week with someone and he was talking about, and again, like no sour grapes for Dan. Even Dan admitted it was time for him to move on when he got fired. Um, and now he's looking back on it with some perspective, but he also has a lot of knowledge, right? Of the way things worked at DC when he was there. And he doesn't have complete knowledge of what's going on now when he's not there, but you know, there are some troubling things that he, he makes mention of in this interview. And there are things that Rocky and I have talked about, right? Like when you start having to have variant covers to prop up the line, like when it becomes necessary, that that's a problem. That's something to worry about. And what Dan was saying was, yeah, so they used to make sure the books were profitable on their own. And then they added the variant covers as sort of icing on the cake, right? Like extra stuff. Now, from everything that's been reported, everything that Dan's aware of from talking to people still at DC, everything that, you know, from outside appearances, it's like the variant covers are necessary to make the books profitable. That's a scary prospect. That's a problem. Uh, and then the other thing that he mentions that I'll, I'll uh, also mention is, yeah, he had a hard and fast rule. Batman could never be more than a third of the line. We all know that's not the case anymore. <laughs> and when you, everything is propped up by one character, you know, what happens when people, and maybe it'll never happen. I mean, Batman, you could argue, has been their number one book, you know, since the 1989 Batman movie. That's what, 30 years? Over 30 years? Maybe people won't yeah. get tired of Batman, but I'm certainly tired of Batman. So anyway, uh, what do you think of this this week, Rocky? Good, well, bad? both it, it's definitely a mixed bag it, it's a mixed bag and i i do share uh i, I do share your trepidation i i, I don't uh there, there, there's always going to be you and i both know and and people who who, who read dc comics there, there's a, there's a, there's still enough to choose from that you can find at least one title that you can enjoy reading so it's not it's not like it's a complete it's it's you know let's not all be embrace depression here okay we don't have to start taking prozac it's it, it's okay the sky is you know i mean the sky is still there you know uh however is the sky falling a little bit in terms of excitement for future events maybe but i gotta be honest with you i don't actually need a big event every year I, that's kind of a miss i, I always I, I always push push back on that when i can at times I, I don't need a big event every year who says we need a big event every year just entertain me just give me a good story. I don't. I don't need you know. Batman Night Terrors is is advertised for the summer event for DC. Okay, okay, maybe it'll be good. Maybe it won't. But I don't need it, and I also don't need to have advertisements or solicitations six months down the road. You know, uh, let me uh, uh, let me just enjoy the comic books as they come out, and you know, maybe just get a tease of what's coming out. Uh, you know, one or two months uh, ahead. I mean, I, I can enjoy that because I mean, I've said to you before, and you and I we're privy. We are privy because we get preview copies. We get a little bit of a heads up on some some future issues, but you know. Uh, even for you and I, uh, and uh, I can't speak for you, but I know for myself, uh, it's a double-edged sword. I don't like knowing what's going to what future solic solicitations say, even though, like everybody else, I'm reading them. Uh, but I do admit, I, it sort of takes away the fun and the expectation. But uh, in any event, it's uh, it's still good. I'm still addicted to comic books, and so uh, you know, I'll always have something to go to therapy for. Yeah, I mean, you and I are both enjoy <laughs> independent more than. Uh, DC or Marvel right now, but it is interesting, right? Like yeah. you would think you look at the industry, obviously it's changed a lot and this is, could be a topic for a whole podcast on its own. Obviously it's changed a lot, right? D direct market is the only thing that's left. There is no more newsstand. Um, but you look back at those newsstand numbers and before the, the kind of the demise of print in general, newsstand numbers used to sell hundreds of thousands of comics. There weren't, I mean, there was a time when there were before the direct market, there were no solicitations. But a lot of times, like when I, when I would go and read, you know, my books when I was a kid and buy them at 7-Eleven or local convenience store or whatever, I, I wasn't pre-ordering my books. 
I didn't know what was coming. Yeah. Was that better? I mean, there weren't solicitations. You, it wasn't hinted at everything. You know what I mean? Like, I know <laughs> there's a tendency to look back with nostalgia, or rose colored glasses or whatever, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing to think about. Like you, if that was successful back then, why would you not try to repeat some of those, like leave the mystery? And there are some creators that do it. Robert Kirkman is good at it, right? He'll do these stealth releases and what have you, yeah. but those are the exception rather than the rule. So yeah, kind of interesting, but. Anyway, let's dive into the first book. Uh, DC Horror Presents Sergeant Rock versus the Army of the Dead, number six, final issue. Bruce Campbell is the writer. Yes, that Bruce Campbell. Uh, Eduardo Riso is the artist. Christian Rossi does colors. Rob Lee on letters. I wouldn't go so far as to say that this ending feels anticlimactic. Um, I mean, let's be fair. It, it, it's Bruce Campbell, who's a fantastically talented uh, actor and, you know, pop culture hero f as his character <laughs> Ash from Evil Dead and that sort of thing. But he's not exactly a seasoned comic book writer, even though he's been a comic book fan for a long time, apparently. Um, so this series didn't exactly have surprises in terms of, you know, strange characterization or, or you know, crazy plot twists or that sort of thing. It was pretty much straightforward paint by the numbers, um, you know, easy company going after, you know, uh, Nazi zombies or zombie Nazis, however you want to put it and, uh, culminating in, in, uh, Sergeant rock fighting Hitler zombie himself. Uh, but it has been fun because it's been all out action. The Eduardo Riso art, he's a fantastic storyteller. I may not be the biggest fan of his style, but he's a great storyteller, especially in terms, of, I think, uh, his art, what it does best, uh, is visual pacing. It's just incredible. And that goes to, you know, being a really good storyteller and having the action depicted well, and it flows really, really well. So uh, again, this, this wasn't, you know, surprising in any way. It was kind of what was expected, but what I expect when you say, okay, Sergeant rock comic written by um, Bruce Campbell and drawn by Eduardo Riso, I expect it to be full of action and a lot of fun. And that's exactly what this was. So, that's not to say I'm disappointed at all in it because it, um, you know, it was what I expected. A lot of times there are comics that where you expect something and you end up being let down, right? It ends up being a disappointment. Yeah. Um, Batman three jokers immediately comes to mind. <laughs> you know, I anticipated that for so long and it was such a letdown and such a disappointment when something like that happens. So when you have expectations and those expectations are uh, exceeded, you know, that is fantastic. But there's also something to be said for meeting those expectations and just having a nice, enjoyable read. And that's what this was. Um, and uh, all members of the creative team really synced together from Campbell's writing to the artwork by Riso and even the color work. You know, this is obviously set in the past, World War II. They're, uh, it's easy company fighting Hitler. Um, but it also has some of those traditional tones you would expect in kind of a horror comic, which you don't always expect a war comic to be a horror comic. It seems like DC mixes the genres a lot uh, these days, which is fine. Horror really sells. Um, war doesn't sell as well as it used to, like back in the 60s or 70s. Um, but the the color work by uh, Rossi, the color artist, is fantastic. You, know, you get a lot of those greens and blues and browns um, that are in shades that you would expect to see in a, in a horror comic. And again, even though it's something to be expected, it's done really well, right? Like it's not a put down at all to say this comic was, you know, what I expected it, it nailed it. Right. And the execution is top notch, like technically a very well put together comic. So, um, you know, I always have reservations when it's a celebrity that's writing a book because you feel like, okay, well, would Bruce Campbell have gotten the chance to write a Sergeant rock comic if he wasn't, <laughs> you know, Bruce Campbell, the actor? Well, no, probably not. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, he's not a, He's not a writer by trade. So, you know, how good of a job is he going to do? Well, it turns out he's going to do a very good job. So th this was a lot of fun. Um, and I, yeah, I would recommend it, especially uh, as a trade. I think it'll read really well in uh, in one sitting. So what were your thoughts, Rocky? I I enjoyed this for, for what it was. Like you said, it didn't, it, this wasn't a sophisticated plot line. I mean, this was, this, 
this was exactly what the title said, and there was really no misdirection or, or, or attempt to mislead the reader. This was Sergeant Rock versus the Army of the Dead, and the Army of the Dead is led by Adolf Hitler, and it ends the way you would expect, with maybe a slight little twist. And it ends with, obviously, their, you know, surprise, surprise, they managed to destroy the, uh, what would appear to, on the surface, destroy the, the villain, or the, the undead Adolf Hitler, and in, in just a be beautiful illustrations, uh, just the art's fantastic. I mean, it, it's 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 very well. I mean, it's very well illustrated. I, I mean, the the art, the, it's the there's violence. It's it's a war comic. It's exactly what you want. It's even got humor. It's got the smart ass tropey dialogue because you know you're talking smart uh, to a cocky Hitler as you as you're slowly killing him in multiple ways. For those people who've dreamt of different ways to kill Adolf Hitler because he's such an evil bad. Bastard. This is the comic for you, and Bruce Campbell uses his imagination. And uh, you know, there's needles in the eyes, there's exploding bodies, there's parts everywhere, there's guns, there's it, it's all kinds of things. And 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 at the end here, this is the, this takes place at the tail end of the war. Uh, and of course, unlike in our history, we now know the true fate of Adolf Hitler. He he didn't commit suicide in a bunker. He was killed by Sergeant Rock, Frank Rock of Easy Company. And following which, uh, there is we have potential potential for new stories here because we know that in the future we might end up with a, a, a uh, there's been a division of anomalous phenomena, a, a, a new division, a top secret division of the U.S. government called Division of Anomalous Phenomena. Maybe we could call that DAP, DAP for short, where Frank Rock is going to be leader of that. So it sort of reminds me of we're going to get maybe future stories similar to like Creature Commandos, but not, not quite. But we're going to have Sergeant Rock leading Easy Company in the post-war era against the weird, crazy phenomena. So now, you know, we got the undead. Will they fight the werewolves? Will they fight Frankenstein? Will they fight all these other weird creatures now moving uh, out of World War II into the uh, post-war World War II era. So they're, you know, so we might see future stories from Bruce Campbell. You never know. Uh, I want to give a shout out to the uh, 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 the alternate cover here uh, by um, uh, uh, Edward Rizzo. Is, uh, he's the main artist. You mentioned him, but the uh, Francisco Francavilla. Yeah, Frank Avia. I, I love. I've been getting all his covers as 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 well on this. I, you know, it's funny. We we you just talked about Dan Didio and and variant covers. Uh, one of I have I do have one rule about variant covers that uh, uh, that I do violate. I do violate my rules from time to time. So I'm a little bit of a hypocrite. It's hard to always follow my own self imposed rules, but. If I'm going to get a variant cover, I got generally two rules that I like to stick with when I have a cover. Number one, they got to be cool. But number two, they got to, they got to relate to the content of the comic. And every single one of these covers does, whether it's Edward Rizzo's cover or Actually, Frank. That, that's, uh, that first one's uh, Gary Frank. Gary Frank, sorry, yeah, uh, yeah. Gary Frank. I mean, you, it, it's related to the content in some way. There's nothing more frustrating. And, and unfortunately, you, you know, with DC, Almost, it's it's in it's insane how how the big two have variant covers that have characters that aren't even on in their comic, or or scenes that have n or posing scenes that have nothing to do with the content of the comic, but just so that you know, just it's it's shameful. It's absolutely shameful, and um, it it's a topic for another day. But I do pose the question, or it's been posed by others, and that is, okay. If I'm right, but is it harmful? Is it actually harming the comic book industry? If it's increasing sales, can we legitimately say it's harming the comic book industry? I have a long theory I won't get into, but I believe it is long-term harming the, the comic book industry. But that's a talk for another day, but we'll get to that. Maybe uh, maybe we'll do a video on that at some point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I yeah. tend to agree with you. I mean, because that's the thing. If it wasn't propping up, maybe the people would be doing other things. Publishers would be doing other things to grow. Uh, readership, like actually having a marketing department, but yeah, topic yeah. topic for another day. <laughs> uh, all right, well, let's move on. Batman Gotham Knights Gilded City is up to the penultimate issue, issue number five. This is from writer Evan Narcisse. Abel is the artist. John is the colorist. Steve Wands on letters. Main cover by Capullo, which is interesting. Uh, like I saw the cover, man, it, it, it's been, I don't know, maybe I'm just tired. I, I didn't, rec I was like, I recognize that Batman art. Who is that? That looks, and I didn't recognize it as Capullo. Like I didn't identify it as Capullo. Just recognize it. It looked very familiar. So, 
shame on me. I was embarrassed that I, I didn't realize who it was. Um, but anyway, th this was a, an okay issue of uh, Gilded City. The majority of this issue takes place in present day. And I think that's why for me, it wasn't as enjoyable as yeah uh, and i should say present day i mean there are some flashbacks to to modern times right but what i've most been enjoying about this gotham knights gilded city story is the runaway story the story set back in the 1880s agreed uh, 1840s 1840s rather um yeah. with the runaway and um vandal savage and these uh these two women i can never remember their names um but that has what Vivian and Portia, right? Portia. Uh, Portia. Yeah, that's the names. But anyway, that's what I've been enjoying most about the story. The, the, the modern time story feels like, I mean, I don't know if Evan Narcisse enjoys the, the, the old time story more as well. That story feels more fleshed out as opposed to the new story, which I feel like I was like, wait, they have a lead on it. Like, um, Tim Drake knows where to go to find out where they're manufacturing. Like, when did I, when did that happen? I must've missed that. Maybe that's just on me for not reading carefully, but I will say even with the, the story that said in the past in the 1840s toward the end of this issue, it felt like maybe Evan realized that he only had one issue left because the last third of this issue felt really choppy to me, felt like we were taking big plot jumps, um, and things weren't as fleshed out as opposed to the early on especially in that story set in the past, it felt like we were moving at a deliberate pace. We're getting all the information we needed. It was a chance for characterization and what have you, but it almost seems like he maybe took a little bit too much time. I, you know, I mean, I enjoyed it, but in terms of, Hey, you only have this many issues to get it done. And now, like I said, that last third of the issue, it felt like he, he realized, Oh man, I only have one issue left and I have to, I still have all these things I have to do. And all of a sudden the pace sped up and it felt a little choppy to me. So a little bit of an uneven issue. And yeah, honestly, the, the present day storyline just doesn't, I don't care that much, you know, like we've had so many, you know, Jason Todd, Batman relationship issue type comics. I get that this is maybe hitting a new audience, you know, an audience that plays the video game and hasn't read a lot of those, but I have read a lot of those. So to me, this was kind of redundant to spend time and space on that, uh, on the relationship between Jason Todd and Batman and, you know, stuff going on with Jason having been killed by the Joker and that sort of thing. Um, really, I mean, sh honestly, shouldn't Jason Todd's beef not be with Bruce Wayne, but be with the callers that yeah. you know, phoned in the 900 number and voted him dead? He should be railing against... <laughs> comic fans not batman himself so yes anyway yeah it felt a little choppy toward the end but the art is fantastic colors fantastic i'd be all in for a, a runway one shot you know i agree page, what have you so I, anyway yeah go ahead rocky what are your thoughts no, I, I agree uh I, but I, I do have some uh like you i have some sympathy for yvonne Narcisse, Narcisse because i do believe because it was based on i guess a video game right i guess yeah. it makes sense that you, you're gonna have to have some modern day you're going to have to maybe have some, at least probably an equal part of your story dedicated to um, the, the modern day adventure, even though the, the, the whole narrative itself is tied together with this sort of like this golden mine virus that originated back in the, the, the late uh, 19th century, which involves the sort of Batman of the 19th century being this runaway character who ultimately runs into the early version of the Court of Owls uh, and also a younger, a slightly younger Vandal Savage. And so it's, it was really cool. And you got, like I said, these two new interesting characters that were uh, LGBTQ characters in 19th century, the Vivian and Portia. That was very interesting. And, and uh, I, I think, uh, you know, I think we like the, that aspect of the story better because it feels newer. It feels like, because we don't know these characters. We're getting to know them is what's more interesting. But for longtime readers like you and I, you know, having, well, you know, a modern day Batman story. Yes, Jason Todd, still the dysfunctional kid of the Batman family. And then Rob, I mean, and then Harley. I mean, just it's the same old tropey stuff we've gotten before. So I really treasure the, 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 those aspects of the those times in this story where Narcisse focuses on the past and on Runaway. Because it's an, in, I find it a far more interesting story. And um, frankly, we didn't really need, I mean, uh, 
I, I agree with you that it felt it felt clunky. This issue, it felt I, I I wanted to get out of the present and go back to the past because really the I'm sure that the secret to the defeating defeating the virus in the present has to do with something that happens in the past. So focus more on the past. But then I'm I'm thinking, well, I suppose you have to you got to focus a little bit more on the present because you want to draw more people into the comic, and for that you need a modern day Batman character in the comic. So, uh, but you know, ironically enough, uh, I am enjoying this series. Uh, I went in skeptical, straight up, straight up. But I have to say that this is, uh, w w let's face it, more than, you talk about Dan Didio's rule, no more than a third of the line being Batman. Well, I think more than a third of the line is Batman. And there's a lot of uh, fat at uh, DC right now that consists of Batman that uh, that we don't need. Uh, but this is actually one of the, you know, this this is better than a lot of the other more mainstream some of the mainstream Batman titles are titles that might be selling a little bit more. And uh, I, th I think this is well done. And I'm looking forward to because uh, we have we have two issues left. And I hope I hope more of it is in the past. I, I hope the solution to this story, the resolution of the story takes takes place more in the past than in the present. But we shall see. Yeah, for some reason, I was thinking this was issue five. Yeah, it's only issue four. So, yeah, that makes it makes that clunkiness you're talking about even more of an more of an issue mm. yeah so he's got two issues left yeah i was thinking he only had one so yeah but you're right you wonder how much of it's editorially driven you know he's trying to tell his story but maybe part way through like hey you need to put more of the present day stuff in here because you know we want people to go and read present day batman as well who knows uh and it brings you back one thing i wanted to mention you were talking about dap um with sergeant rock department you know uh and i thought yeah first thing you do is go and look okay department of you know abnormal whatever and I, yeah. and I was like, wait, DAP, that's not exactly the best acronym, but whatever. <laughs> <I know. laughs> but for it to end with the beginning, I, yeah. I was of two minds. Like, is this Bruce Campbell kind of saying, hey, DC, let me write more? Or does that come from him? And mm -hmm. he would write more about DAP and uh, Sergeant Rock? Or is it was it editorial that came in and said, hey, at the end, we would like you to tease that there could be more. Uh, maybe that'll get fans to ask for more. So you want? I wonder if it was, you know, Bruce Campbell that did that or DC editorial. And then yeah. it also, you know, what you were saying, this idea of um, Frank Rock heading that up, like, would that be a way to bring Frank Rock into more present time? You know, like, a, Could be, yeah. like a director bones, you know what I mean? Like he'd yeah. no longer be the soldier out there, but like sit behind the desk suit, old man. Well, kind of they, they, DC's done that in the past. They, they've had an yeah. older Sergeant Rock in the past. I, yeah. I think sometime in the nineties, I can't remember the details anymore, but uh, so it, I think, it's been hinted at in the past, anyway. They could, yeah, they could use uh, somebody as a replacement for Amanda Waller. That's not a, you know, worthless yeah. villain. Wouldn't that be cool if somebody ends up killing Waller, taking her off the map, and ends up being an older Sergeant Sergeant Rock? That would be awesome. Yeah, I mean, Sergeant Rock to me, he's he's <laughs> much better suited to lead to you know organize the Suicide Squad than Amanda yeah. Waller. <laughs> but anyway, we're yeah. blue sky in here. Let's uh, get back on topic. Batman and Robin, number five. This is the last issue of this. It's even titled Finale, written by Mark Wade. Uh, Mahmoud Azrar is the artist. Jordi Belair on color. Steve Wands on letters. I don't have a whole heck of a lot to, to say about this. I'll let Rocky do the majority of the talking. It does finish up um, the Lazarus Island uh, or Lazarus Planet storyline. It does a good job of that. I'll also credit Mark Wade. Here is, you know, Mark Wade showing his veteran experience as a comic writer. He sums up what, the, like, the entire story of of Lazarus Island in just two pages, and it shows you that in a way there wasn't a whole lot to the event. And again, you know, we talked about it when we talked about Lazarus Planet Omega. That should have been a four issue or a six issue mini. There shouldn't have been all the superfluous uh, one shots and what have you. And based on, how, and again, a lot of it is Mark Wade's experience, but based on how expertly he can sum it up in just two pages, it didn't need all the stuff that it had. And it also goes back to something Rocky just said about, we don't need all the events. We don't need all the constant events. Sometimes it's okay to just, you know, tell a story within a book, you know, or come out with a mini series and have it be self-contained. I just don't like the way DC is, uh, is doing its, its events right now. Other than that, in terms of wrapping up the story, I know Mark Wade was going for something really emotional with what happens at the end with Batman and, and him being kind of saved by the people of Gotham. But it just came across as really, really cheesy and kind of emotionally overwrought to me. 
it didn't land for me at all. I, I just, <laughs> I kind of did an eye roll going, Oh my God, all the people of Gotham, we are Batman. Uh, yeah. It just, it didn't work for me. Maybe it was just a frame of mind I was in when I, um, when I read it, or maybe it goes back to what Didio was saying. If you give us so much Batman, you're, um, you're diluting it, right? Like if we only got a couple Batman, big Batman stories a year, maybe something like this would have landed for me more as opposed to just being another Batman eye roll moment. Um, you know, we all know when something, when you have a little bit of something, you make it scarce, it becomes more valuable, right? And more people want it. Um, but when it's just plentiful, uh, ubiquitous, then nobody cares. And that's kind of how I felt about this. Like this moment that was supposed to be so emotional with Batman being resurrected by the people of Gotham was just like a sh shoulder shrug, eye roll, <laughs> didn't care. So anyway, what were your thoughts? Well, you know, it's funny. You talk about the mood that you were in. I could easily imagine myself being in a mood where the ending of this story, this La Lazarus Planet story, where I would feel like you. But I actually felt the opposite, uh, strangely enough. And yet I can completely understand why you would feel the way you did. But it was actually kind of refreshing to me in a sense that, you know, for once, you know, the people of Gotham are, you know, they have a pretty shitty life as it is. They live in the worst city in the DC universe. I mean, even yeah, Bloodhaven. Why, why do they live there? I know, exactly. Question. I mean, even Bloodhaven is now a happier place thanks to Nightwing than, 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 than Gotham City. And it's nice that, that you know, and I know that, again, we always sound like broken records at DC. We want more hope and blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, finally, Mark Wade is bringing some of that to Batman and Robin here. He's done it with World's Finest. And one of the themes that Mark Wade uh, has brought to World's Finest is that he's kept the story simple, yet sophisticated enough that uh, he's familiar enough with continuity. He understands the core essence of the characters. And yet he is kind of keeping it light. He doesn't quite go full dark because he keeps that, he keeps that, that passion and that and that superheroism there at its heart. And at the end of Batman and Robin here, you know, all is not lost, even when it really is, because there's no question that at the end of this, Damien knows that he has failed to, to get the, the demon Nezha completely flushed out of his father's body. Batman is, his, his life force is gone, and even the combined forces and powers of, of, the, of uh, Zatanna and Dr. Fate and all the other, all the people that are there, the, the, magic, uh, the magic users of the DC Universe can't save, they, they, can't, they can't suck the, enough life force out of others who are, because most of the members of the Bat family are unconscious. They can't obtain enough life force to basically save Batman's life. So Damien calls upon the people of Gotham City to do it. And now you now one can certainly look at the story and say, you know what, this is Duke Ek Machina. Oh, you know, this is God in the machine. You know, a, a ridiculous ending is, you know, boring the life force from various individuals of Gotham City. But but really, I'm thinking, I, I, I still, there's something about the ending I like because no matter how dark Gotham City is, you know, you, and you said it, Jace. I mean, wh why the hell do people want to live in Gotham City? Well, you know what? They're a glutton for punishment, but damn, they have hope. They must have more hope than we do because something's keeping them there. And and knowing that they have that protector, Batman, knowing that Batman's in trouble and for them to, to be willing to give a little piece of themselves, however small, to save someone that they know to be a hero and who's taken the bullet for them more than once both literally and metaphorically uh it, it was i thought i thought it was a nice ending and kind of frankly given the outrageous aspect of some aspects of the planet lazarus story with the lazarus rain which is a little hokey to begin with i thought well you know i, I went with it i went with it overall i i think that i'm a little bit i will say i'm slightly on the disappointed side that Lazarus Planet ended up being more of a vehicle to introduce new characters as opposed to really exploring a, a, a very interesting plot line. Uh, it was, you know, it, uh, it, it, it was okay for me. And, and you know what? I'm, I, I like that this is a softening up of Damien, that Damien was willing to give his own life to save his dad. And that's, and, and we, and I think that focus alone, that Damien was so, Damien was willing to give his own life essence to save his father. That is huge. That's Damien coming a long way. We remember we, a young narcissistic Damien Wayne was so concerned about, he was a better bat, he'll be a better Batman than his dad was. And the Batman 666 and all this, uh, all this rumors and innuendo and within, within DC continuity about is Damien going to 
uh, grow up to be the the demon, uh, you know, embrace the Ra's al Ghul legacy? Is he going to be a very bad Batman? Is he? What's he going to do with the legacy of Batman? And we we got a softening up of Damian Wayne. He got friendship during Williamson's Joshua Williamson's Robin Run uh, on Lazarus Island, and and this is in many ways with, with Damian embracing his father uh, at the end of this story. This is Damian coming full circle. That he's not only is he is he. Uh, he's stronger now because he softened himself up emotionally and he's more stronger than ever before. And that's, that's a, epitomized by him holding his father after the people of Gotham City appropriately, you know, extend some of their, some of their support for him. So in, in a way, it really is uplifting of the concept of Batman and Robin because they didn't just save Batman. They really saved Batman and Robin here because with no Batman, there's no Batman and Robin. So I look at it from a little bit more of a, maybe too much of a, maybe a spiritual philosophical sense, but I actually got some enjoyment out of this ending. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm right. I agree with you in that it was a nice change of pace to have the citizens of Gotham save the day, as opposed to, you know, some hero, some magic user, because yeah, that, that does end up feeling deus ex machina. So yeah, I agree with you there, but yeah, just, it was the emotionality that just didn't land for me for, for whatever reason, but, yeah, maybe in a different. If I read it at a different time, different mood, maybe that would be the case. So, anyway, let's move on. Uh, up next, talk about emotional. Uh, we have Human Target number twelve from writer Tom King. Art, incredible art by Greg Smallwood, as we've had throughout. Letters by Clayton Cowles. Uh, obviously, Smallwood is coloring his own art here. And even though Christopher Chance does show up in this issue, it's only as a uh, flashback, right? Like he passed away at the end of last issue. Um, and, you know, it's th this is basically kind of the aftermath of his death and really an ice focused issue in terms of, you know, what's the fallout? Like, wh where is ice at now emotionally now that, uh, you know, she she killed this guy. She accidentally poisoned Christopher Chance and then got close to him worried that he was going to, to try to steer him away from finding out it was her to basically confessing once he did find out it was her and then willing to sacrifice her own life, like, you know, completely putting herself at the mystery or at the mercy rather of Christopher chance saying, yeah, I deserve, I deserve to die. Like what a, could there be a more appropriate Tom King <laughs> love story, right? Like when you think about <laughs> the way that Tom writes, you know, tragedy. <laughs> here, here it is. This this hero who was tortured in an unimaginable way by Lex Luthor decides to finally get some justice. I wouldn't even call it revenge. I would say it's justice for the despicable things that Luthor's done, not only to, to Ice but to everybody. Um, and in doing so, accidentally poisons somebody else. And I won't say poison somebody noble because Christopher Chance is not noble. That's what you know, he's no more noble than, you know, any average person is there. Everybody has their own kind of innate nobility. Most people do. Um, but he, he comes across as such an every man here. Right. And for, for ice to accidentally poison Christopher chance. And then in trying to prevent him from discovering that she was responsible to fall in love with him, like, and fall in love in such a way, you know, this isn't some sort of uh, like, you know, teenage fling or what have you, or, or immature sort of version of love where it's all based on physicality or, you know, it's the excitement of something new. This is like a, a mature, like a meeting of, of soulmates, you know, not that I necessarily believe in soulmates, but that's what, what we're getting here from Tom King. Two people that were sort of fated and destined to always be together and they fit together so perfectly. And you see that and it's beautifully illustrated by Greg Smallwood. But no matter what, the inevitability is coming that Christopher Chance is going to die and Ice, at the end of the day, regardless of her intentions, is responsible for that. How completely tragic, how completely tragic that her accidental poisoning of Christopher Chance led her to discover who should have been the love of her life, right? And they could have grown, grown old together or what have you. Like, oh my God, the angst, <laughs> the tragedy, the yeah. sadness, the inherent Tom Kingness of it all. Like, it was just, <laughs> it, and, 
and, and that's fine, right? Like that's all great. And it makes for a good story and a compelling read. And, and, you know, if someone were to sit and explain to you, you know, Hey, this is the plot of the human target, uh, 12 issue series. And here's kind of what happens and what have you, and you, you know, nod your head and go, oh, yeah, that's kind of interesting and sad and tragic. But where it transcends all that in terms of story is in the execution, right? In in the dialogue that King gives us, in the moments, in the way that, and I'm sure he, he, that King probably did less of his normal uh, full script than he usually does. I mean, I know, I'm sure it was a full script, but the thing is he got matched up with the perfect artist, right? To give us this almost mod yes. style. Uh, and I'm sure he gave Greg Smallwood, you know, a lot of creative license to, you know, handle those moments. And um, it's not just the line work and just the framing, but also the color, the color work that Greg Smallwood does. Like I have every expectation that this series is going to be nominated for Eisner's and rightly so, because as compelling and as interesting as that and tragic as that story is, as I've kind of outlined it here, the execution is even better. This is a perfectly executed comic. You could make an argument here or there. They could have done this better. This moment could have played out better. This or, you know, that or pacing here or there. You know, if you went comic by comic, page by page, you might be able to nitpick, you know, a few things. None, no, no, no issues stand out in my mind. No problems stand out in my mind. But you might be able to go through and, you know, pick out a, you know, point here or there. I would challenge anybody to be able to go and look at it in terms of execution and point out any flaws. Like, to me, this is an example of how to perfectly execute a story. It is just absolutely uh, amazing. And I, I didn't talk, talk a lot about actual plot moments or uh, actual story beats in this issue. I'll leave that to Rock if he wants to do it. But uh, for me, this was just, it was just amazing. It was so good. Uh, read it a few weeks ago when we first got it. And then read <laughs> yeah. it again this week. <laughs> And it, it yeah. you know, landed even more. Um, and, you know, going back to what we were just talking about with Batman and Robin, what, how that didn't land for me. Um, and yet this did. Maybe it, it just, this was more subtle uh, and hinted at things, uh, which I also really, really enjoyed. Um, so, yeah, I thought it was fantastic. And that David Nakayama cover, I mean, like I said at the beginning, this is an ice issue, right? This issue is all about ice and how she's dealing with the loss of uh, of the love of her life. And that David Nakayama cover, I mean, you, Rocky just talked about it earlier, how you, we really have gotten away from covers that focus on things that actually happen inside the comic, which is super annoying. That's what we used to get. It was almost like part of the story. It captured a moment of the story. This is, you know, more modern style and it is, a, you know, just a pinup, just a splash page of ice. But I will say this is an ice issue. This is issue is, all about yes. ice and her emotions. So, and it's gorgeous from Nagiyama. So I was fine with it. That's the cover I, I got for sure. So anyway, what were your thoughts? How did you think this wrapped up? Well, I honestly, you did, you, you did, you, I agree with everything you said. You, you beautifully encapsulated why this series is just so incredible. And, uh, you know, it, it, it should be noted that, you know, the central plot point of this series about, you know, ice and, you know, fire conspiring to kill Lex Luthor and, and it going awry and Christopher Chance being the individual who ends up being poisoned, having 12 days to live. And in an effort to, to get Christopher Chance off off the, the their scent as because they're the ones that orchestrated the attempted murder of Lex Luthor, my God, ice falls in love with Christopher Chance. And it's a love story. And but we actually knew that in issue ten, so one I prompts the question: Well, what's the point of issues eleven and twelve? Well, all I can say is, uh, it's 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 those moments that you talked about. Uh, first of all, the Greg Smallwood art we can enjoy anywhere. This is the best art of his career, and I remember I, I've got Greg Smallwood art going when he was when he was drawing Betty and Veronica. I mean. Uh, he was doing covers for uh, uh, horror on Betty and uh, on, for Archie comics. And boy, is his art just, it continues to, uh, wow. But the, the emotional moments here are just incredible. And you, you nailed it here about this. This is Ice coming to terms with the fact that she essentially killed a man that she loved. I mean, the, the lover of her life. And what, there, there are two moments here in, in this story that really, really hammered it home for me that have nothing to do with the central part, but 
central plot, which again was resolved in issue 10. That's not why, if you've been drawn into this story, you're not reading this story from the plot for the plot anymore. It's, it's for getting it. It's, it's for the very dialogue that, uh, that we're, but we're gifted with by Tom King and the amazing art. When Christopher Chance is, you know, this this series, this issue opens up with him him basically being dead on the bed, and then she's reflecting back, and uh, you, you jump forward in time, and then you jump back again, and you there's a conversation where where Christopher Chance talks about how when his dad died, he thought his dad died like a coward. He thought his dad died afraid, and that his dad his dad died groveling you know, trying to stay alive, but his dad was shot. And he, he came to the realization that, that his dad really died. His dad wasn't afraid that his dad may, his dad may have died on his knees groveling, but he wasn't afraid. He was, he was doing that because his dad wanted one more day with him. Just like he wants one more day with ice. He could, he could relate to his dad. And so it, that comes full circle that because at different parts in this narrative, the emotional journey that Christopher Chance was on was reconciling his relationship with his father and how his father had died and how it's the circumstances of his father's death that had him become the human target in the first place. And so there's a certain type of synchronicity between the passing of his father, how his father left this world and how he leaves it as well. Basically leaving it, wishing that you would have one more day, one more time. Uh, and why? For, for, the, for all the right reasons, because of love. His dad loved him, wanted more time with his son. He wants to have more time with Ice. Ironically, hit the person who murdered him. <laughs> and that's just incredible. And um, uh, finally, of course, I mean, I almost don't want to give away the ending, uh, but the fact that the motivation that led Fire and Ice to want to take the life of uh, Lex Luthor, uh, let's just say that Christopher Chance actually shares that motivation at the end. And it's, it's a, it's, it's a wonderful ending. And it's very, I thought it was very interesting. I, I love the uh, scotch drinking aspect of Christopher Chance. He was always a drinker. And I love the fact that his ashes are in a scotch bottle <laughs> in a whiskey bottle. And uh, at, at, at one part at the end, ice is sitting there and she creates a floating ice cube and she's got the, the, ice, the, the bottle with her, but not filled with scotch, but rather with Christopher Chance's ashes as she talks to it. And they have their, their have more conversation. I, I thought there's just so many really beautiful moments here that, you know, you know, kudos to Tom King uh, that, you know, it's one thing for Greg Smallwood to draw this, but Greg Smallwood can only draw what Tom King inspires him to draw in the script. And so high plays to Tom King here because with the plot already being over in issue 10, for me to remain more entertained by issue, in issue 11 and 12 and nailing the landing here. And I love, I love the ending. And I, I just high praise, uh, deserving of an Eisner, no question. Uh, so far, the, the best of the year so far of 2023. And we'll, we'll see, we'll see if it gets much competition before the end of the year. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's interesting, right? Like King has had these real impactful series matched up with really talented artists. Obviously Mitch Garrett's comes to mind, Clay Mann. I, I know that, um, um, Heroes in Crisis wasn't exactly well received. Now, now add add Greg Smallwood to that uh, stable <laughs> of artists, right? Like everybody's like, oh, what are King and Garrett's going to do next? Can't wait, can't wait to find out. Um, well, we know right now they're going to do Batman: Brave and the Bold, a Joker story. Uh, but now the question becomes, okay, so now what are King and Smallwood going to do next, right? Because you know, you know that Smallwood and King have to know what a special comic they created uh, in collaboration. So why would they not want to work together? again, you know, and all of a sudden it's going to be more Eisners for King. Uh, and yeah, we're saying human target should win. I mean, and Tom's won a lot and I'm sure he'd be the first to say if he doesn't win for human target, you know, it's going to be no skin off his nose, but I don't think Greg Smallwood has ever won an Eisner and he 100% deserves <laughs> an Eisner for that. Like, I, don't get me wrong. There are tons of great talented comic artists out there working in the industry right now, but Nobody comes close to touching Greg Smallwood on Human Target right now. I'm sorry. They just don't. For the past 12 issues, past year, what have you, nobody has created more beautiful comic art in a book than Smallwood on Human Target. That's just, he's got to run away with it in my mind. Uh, so anyway, let's move on. Uh, Punchline, the Gotham game number five is up next. 
This is from writers Tinney and Blake Howard. Gleb Melnikoff is the artist, Luis Guerrero on colors, Becca Carey on letters. Uh, you know what's interesting? I've been enjoying um, this Punchline series a lot more the last couple of issues. And I kind of asked myself, what, like, why am I enjoying this more? First of all, we've had a, a couple of issues in a row here with like all out action um, with Punchline, it, it kind of a three way battle, right? Like you've got uh, Punchline fighting against uh, Black Mass gang, and then you've got Nightwing and Bluebird and uh, kind of the good guys uh, faction as well. So all, all three sort of fighting against themselves. There's been very little room uh, for Punchline herself to be in the book, to go on her diatribes, <laughs> to you know say her silly nonsense and act completely insane, uh, illogical, which just bugs me. And so I think that's what I've been enjoying about it. Like it's been some fantastic art from Gleb Melnikov, really bright uh, colors from Luis Guerrero that uh, convey what's going on in a, uh, you know, emotionally with the, all this action really, really well. Um, and not a lot of room for punchline. And so, and it's been paced well, uh, also kind of this breakneck pace with all this fighting, um, as opposed to early on where the fast pace felt uh, like we were missing out on things, like things were a little bit choppy. When it's action packed like this and it's fighting, you sort of expect it to be fast paced and jump from this fight scene to this fight scene to this fight scene. So it's almost like the story um, took itself in a direction to lead to the strengths of the writers. Uh, which as a writer, that's what you should be doing. Um, and the fact we're getting less punchline while we're getting more punching uh, is really working for me. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm curious to see how this ends, you know, uh, despite the fact that I've been enjoying it, maybe because of the lack of punchline, you know, I am interested a little bit in, in how this is going to play out in terms of consequences for her, what it means for her going forward. So I, I, maybe I'm coming around on punchline as a character a little bit, uh, but it's easier to do that, I think, when I get less of her, uh, which is such a uh, a unique contrast with a book we're going to talk about later on where a character doesn't show up much and it's what I find wrong <laughs> wrong with the book. So, But anyway, we'll talk about that in a little bit. What what were your thoughts on uh, on Punchline, the Gotham Game 5? Uh, you know, you make an interesting comment about her not necessarily being in the comic as as much as you might expect her to be. Uh, I have a slightly different twist because I've kind of been like, I've, uh, I really didn't like the direction that punchline took with her whole trial and everything. I think they took the wrong approach to the character, but she has been slightly growing on me too. And the reason why it's beginning to work on me a little bit is with respect to one aspect of how, how Teeny and Blake Howard are crafting this story in conjunction with what Teeny Howard is doing in the pages of Catwoman. And... And essentially what it boils down to is I almost feel like Punchline, Punchline reminds me of Walter White a little bit. Because when I criticize Punchline in the storyline, I'm thinking to myself, Punchline is a glorified chemist. That's all she is. She's a chemist. And she goes to the Royal Flush Gang because she's got a, she's got a, she wants to market a new drug. And so she's really good in chemistry. Well, I mean, why would, uh, how many drug, how many drug traffickers or mobsters uh, elevate their chemists. I mean, you make my drugs, you make my drugs or I kill you. So what does Punchline bring to the table with the Royal Flush Gang? I, I found that hard to believe. But then I thought to myself, well, wait a minute, there's Walter White, you know, with Breaking Bad. He was a chemist and he became a drug dealer and a drug trafficker and like his own kind of mob boss. And I'm thinking, is this the route that maybe Punchline is going here? Because she's basically a glorified chemist. She was, uh, uh, she's, I guess she's not really insane anymore. She's just extremely narcissistic and she wants to basically do her own thing. She basically used the Joker who ends up showing up at the end of this issue. She basically uses the Joker. Uh, it's revealed really to, to, to prop herself up as a means to get to, to prop herself up. So she wasn't really like a sidekick of the Joker. Not really. I'm not getting that sense. Although she benefited from her, his, her association with the Joker, which she elevated on social media which she utilized as a way to get off uh, and found not guilty at the trial and then utilized her influence to get some uh influence over the royal flush gang and now she's trying to become a player and amongst the mobsters and fellow mobsters in gotham city and and part of that involved manipulating uh catwoman and uh ultimately uh 
you know, in the pages of Catwoman, we know that uh, th this detective Ventura, who ends up at the beginning of this issue, she knows that somebody basically set up Catwoman. We know that somebody, that there's another player, uh, there's something else going on here that uh, manipulated events that the fire that led to the, the that 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 led to the destruction of the the royal flush uh to that one warehouse where valmont was killed and selena took the blame for it why did selena take the blame it's clear that selena didn't do anything we know that uh, uh detective uh, da ventura knows that meanwhile here in these pages we've got we've got punchline who's trying who's who the black mask is essentially trying to take him out and Punchline has their own, the Royal Flush Gang have their own, uh, they have their Port Royal, their Port Royale, which is their own warehouse where Cullen Roy, the, the, the brother of uh, Bluebird, uh, uh, Harper Rowe, uh, Cullen, Cullen Rowe, he's being held captive by his former lover, uh, Bluff, who's a member of the Royal Flush Gang. And uh, Bluebird and Nightwing rescue him. Uh, meanwhile, there's these, I guess, nanotech creatures sporting different, you know, the, like a spade, a club, a heart, like a different, different aspects of a of a car, deck of cards, and they're like nanotech creatures that ultimately Harper Row manages to disassemble, uh, but not before before the ending. Where, long story short, here, Punchline gets shot by Black Mask, and. Uh, interestingly enough, instead of going back to rescue her, the Royal Flush Gang abandoned Punchline. So uh, there might be some comeuppance there, but they basically leave Punchline basically shot and hope and leave her to her own devices. And the issue ends, I think, a little bit wonky. I don't know how the Joker, the Joker happens to be wandering as a bum in the streets of Alleytown and stumbles upon Punchline in a garbage bin. I, I find that really hard to believe. Uh, I, you know, I'm assuming it's the Joker. What is the Joker doing there? The Joker, you know, it just seems really odd that he would just show up there or maybe he knew, how did he even know she would be there? So it's a little wonky in that respect. But at the same time, there's a strange kind of, uh, choreography that I don't really understand the dance that the Howards are doing here yet. I'm, the moves impress me a little bit. Like I'm, I am intrigued. I remain curious as to where this is going is punchline going to end up a leader of the royal flush gang is she going to hit rock bottom because i want her to fail more i think she needs to be developed more and fail more as a character before be, before she becomes elevated and i think she'll you can generate more interest in her that way as opposed to just immediately elevating her and so she's lost here this is punchline at her rock bottom here she's been shot she's dying in a garbage bin found by the joker who she basically used uh, for her own uh, devices anyway uh, at least that's my interpretation of things how is the joker going to react to her is she going to have a confrontation with the joker next issue we'll have to wait and see but I'm intrigued. I was actually surprised. You know, I, I actually enjoyed this issue and I'm curious to see where it, where it takes us. So you're on mute there, Jason. Dang, I told myself I wasn't going to do that this episode. But yeah. anyway, uh, yeah, interesting, uh, interesting take. I do echo your sentiments about the Joker. Oh, he just happens to fall in a garbage bin. He just happens <laughs> to go walking by. Come on, man. Um, but it's comics. I'll, I'll sort of forgive it. So. Anyway, moving on, Action Comics number 1052, House of Metallo from writer Philip Kennedy Johnson, art by Rafa Sandoval, colors by Matt Herms, letters by Dave Sharp. And then we have uh, the second story, which is in that Rebirth era, Lois and Clark, uh, written by Dan Jurgens, art is by Lee Weeks, colors by Elizabeth Breitweiser, and letters by Rob Lee. And then we have what I know is Rocky's favorite of the issue, the uh, Marguerite Bennett drawn <laughs> Uh, Leia Williams written a uh, Power Girl story, letters by Becca Carey, obviously. Uh, I'm sorry, I think I said Marguerite Bennett, Marguerite Sauvage art. Um, and she colors her own uh, as well. So, um, yeah, the, the first story is very appropriately named, you know, House of Metallo. I hope you guys all listened to my Philip Kennedy Johnson interview from a few weeks ago because he talked so much about, uh, you know, where Superman is headed talked about his him powering up, talked about what a threat Metallo is. And so we're getting to see all of that play out in this particular issue with Metallo, even recruiting some members of this Blue Earth um, organization who are basically white supremacists in terms of 
they all they are only for earthlings no aliens so they want superman and all the superman family to be dead to be off of earth uh, they don't want any of these war world people around um and i get it like they're worried they they they're talking about hey these people bring threats in but i i think that's the wrong way to go about thinking you know it's that whole idea that if you bring a you know a knife to a fight then your opponent's going to bring a gun and then you'll bring a you know, a machine gun and then they'll bring a grenade and it's that, you know, escalation. And that's what these blue earthers are about. But I think the cat's already out of the bag in the DC universe. So there's going to be threats no matter what you do. So you might as well have super powered people um, to help fight those things off, you know, whether they're alien or not. So um, that's an interesting aspect of the story though, that does sort of um, mirror what's going on in, you know, real society in terms of uh, intolerance right now, I'll say. Uh, but the other thing this showcases, and in a less overt way than the first issue, which I kind of like, right? It takes a backseat to the actual story itself, is the power levels of Superman. He's fighting Metallo. He freezes him with his freeze breath and then punches him out into space. Like, just punches him and he goes, and he doesn't like slowly float up. No, he goes out into space, like up like a rocket ship. And that's just so cool, right? Like, Superman is at that level now. Um, and then Metallo, Metallo falls back to Earth, and unlike Batman, you, you know, you buy that Metallo is going to survive a fall back to Earth. The guy's made out of metal, <laughs> powered by kryptonite. So I was, I was perfectly fine with that. He crashes down. He runs into the, some of these Blue Earthers, and then uh, there's a bit of a misunderstanding. The Blue Earthers attack him, and he's like, "All right, let's teleport back to my base. I'm about to make you members of uh, my own family. You know, I'm, I, I have a family of aliens I'm going to take out. I'm going to create a family of my own." Uh, and that's where the, this idea of a, a Metallo family comes in. So, uh, yeah, Philip Kenny Johnson told me uh, that Metallo is, you know, more formidable than ever. And he's putting his money where his mouth is. Um, the aspect of, of who is calling the shots, it it seemed like it was Lex Luthor, but Superman seems to think that it's not. The evidence seems to point that it's not. But at the same time, you never put anything past Luthor. Could be misdirection. But also, Philip did mention that he kind of wants to leave Luther off the table because Luther is playing such a big role in Joshua Williamson's Superman title right now. So if it's not Lex, then I don't have any idea who it could be, which is an interesting mystery and could make for an interesting twist. Or it could be that Lex has just created, you know, almost like um, an AI version of himself and has turned it loose inside uh, Metallo. But either way... Um, it's an interesting setup and it's a fun issue, a uh, fun story with uh, tons of action, great art by Rafa Sandoval. Um, if I have any nitpick at all, uh, it would be that Kevin Metallo, you, you have worked for Luther time and time again. You've followed his orders and gotten your ass kicked by Superman. That's the whole reason you didn't want to do it this time when Luther showed up. Um, but then, you know, based on the coercion, because Luther has your sister, you, you felt like you had no choice. I totally get that. But what I don't get, like, you're already so wary and distrustful of Luther. But then when Luther shows up and says, yeah, so I told you you had to take out the Stillworks Tower and you did. But now I'm not going to set your sister free because of this, that and the other. He buys it like he believes it. Right. Like. In we fairness, that's not L Luther. That's Tracy. His and right, a, it's right. a it's I a hologram it. of his sister, so it might not right. be Luther. Yeah. Right, it is a hologram of his sister that tells him that. But the hologram of his sister is saying Luther's doing this, Luther's doing that, and he's believing it. And yeah. there, there's no longer the distrust of, well, Luther's manipulating me. Like you didn't want to fight Superman because you're tired of Luther. First of all, you're tired of getting your ass kicked and losing every time, and you're tired of Luther's machinations. You know your sister's in the hands of Luther, but you but and it's and it's not really your sister. It's not like you're sitting there in front of her. You have to be smart enough to know you are made out of metal. You are in in some sense, you know, a cyborg. So technology it can all be manipulated, that sort of thing. He never for one second stops to question: Is this really my sister saying this? Is it could it just be a computer generated hologram? You know, again, it's a minor nitpick necessary for the story, but I I. I don't believe it even for a second, right? I know it's all just pulling the strings of Metallo. And it sort of seemed like at the beginning, when Metallo showed back up, he'd wised up and knew better than to just 
let his, you know, strings be pulled. And that's kind of like he's forgotten that. So again, it's a minor nitpick. For the most part, I really enjoyed the story and uh, and the art. And I'll give you a chance to chat about it, Rocky, before we move on to uh, the second story. Uh, yeah, well, just to add to some of your comments, uh, the Superman family itself, uh, uh, the, the twins, the, the orphan twins now that uh, Lois Lane and Clark Kent have adopted, Ortho and Ossel, uh, I, think, I think it was Ortho that, that thought that Metallo sounded a lot like an unmade, uh, which is basically uh, uh, something that they had on War World that uh, involved, you know, they would take the corpses of the dead and, and they would involve some magic and necromancy and all this other science and weird science and uh, probably orphan box science and they would create these unmade creatures and it sounds like Metallo is like a version of that and so just and so as a way of equalizing the playing field we know from the we know from last issue that Superman is more powerful than ever before well part of the reason why Metallo is more powerful than ever before is because of the orphan box and and to further level the playing field Metallo at the end of this issue mentions that he is going to create a Metallo family um this is um this is interesting. I this can become. Uh, I do have some concerns. Uh, there's there's this tendency now with DC that every single hero has to have a family. Uh, I, I think that there's too many players already in this story. Uh, frankly, I I I don't think Power Girl is a member of the Superman family. In fact, we'll we'll talk about that when we get to the story. Even Power Girl doesn't think she's a member of the Superman family. <laughs> That's because she's not. Uh, but it's neither here nor there. But it's it's nice to see Power Girl. But I digress. All these Superman players on the playing field. I mean, come on, it's so powerful. Superman is so powerful. Does anybody really, I still don't feel that Metropolis is in danger at all. This many superhero people. Uh, Philip Kennedy Johnson has his work cut out for him. And uh, I know that he's up to it. And I did uh, listen to, to your uh, review. Uh, but at the same time, with this many super powered uh, Kryptonians guarding Metropolis, uh, you know, I question whether a family of Metallos is going to make me blink twice, but uh, but we'll see. Uh, I I will I agree with you that the art's fantastic. Superman kicking ass with Metallo, freezing him with super cold breath, throwing him into space. That was epic. The fight scenes here are fantastic. The art's fantastic. It it really is. I, I'm I'm vested in this story. I'm vested in this story. So if I sound critical, it's because it's because I'm invested in this story and it's cool. <laughs> and I'm just curious. Okay, how are you gonna come? How are you gonna how are you gonna be competitive when you have an entire Superman family? Also, you can't have soup. It, it almost can't be Lex Luthor behind this because Lex Luthor wants Superman to, to lead Super Corps. Under Williamson's run, uh, if I was Superman right now, I would go. I would call Mercy Graves and and have Supercore investigate what's going on with Metallo. And that way, you would, you know, if if, Super, if Lex Luthor's behind it, you'd probably find out. You'd be able to, you know, find out relatively quickly, or be able to play some, you know, do your own investigating. You, he, Superman has an entire massive super corporation on his side now that can pr help protect metropolis so that's why i'm thinking that clearly it's not lex luther we also know that somebody is out to kill lex luther so superman's enemy lex luther's enemies now are supermans because of supercore and williamson's run now how that's going to be incorporated here for pkj's run i'm not sure but i like what he's doing with the blue with the blue earth movement i like that uh now I, and i say that with no trepidation because the Blue Earth Movement does sound like it could be incorporating some some politics. You know, we got immigration, except we got alien immigration, alien immigrants from the Earth for from uh, from War World living on living in Metropolis. But uh, I think it raises some issues that are pretty that are interesting and worth talking about. He even talks to his uh, Ortho and Orso uh, when they ask him about it. He says, "Look, the people." Don't judge the people of the Blue Earth Movement. They're they're just they just don't know all the information, and they're just they're misinformed. And uh, you know they're they're people too. They have their perspectives. And Superman, of course, Clark Kent is being the you know that's he, Superman is being Superman, and he's he's saying the right things to Arthur, and also basically saying don't be too judgmental. Uh, remember that nobody sets out to be a villain, and that's that's really probably one of the central themes of this story, and maybe even the Metallo story that. You know, John Corbin never set out to be a villain, just like no members of the Blue Earth Movement think of themselves as a villain. Nobody's the villain in their own story, and Superman is aware of that, and he's trying to teach that to Arthur and Ossel. And so I, um, it's, it's a good issue, and uh, I continue to be, um, I continue to be, you know, I'm, I'm, inv I'm vested in what PKJ is doing in here. 
<clears throat> yeah, fair enough. Um, the second story, it feels like it really hasn't gotten going yet. We know it's set, uh, you know, on the farm in Smallville and Lois and Clark, uh, again, at this point in, in kind of Superman's career where he's at, he's not at a place where his identity is really out there. The, the, the other Superman, the the, uh, the New Fifty Two Superman is, you know, this is the pre uh, the post crisis Superman, but the uh, New Fifty Two Superman is still out there. They haven't sort of been merged, like whatever. I've never got a real good explanation with that. Um, but anyway, um, so they're not exactly out and about. You know, Superman's wearing the black costume and he's sort of helping out in in secret, and they're trying to raise John and. Um, you know, trying to show him how to use his powers and deal with all that sort of stuff. Um, and then at the end of last issue, we saw this woman show up. John went out on his own against his parents' wishes. Um, if they'd known, I mean, he knows he's not supposed to be out there. And so we get some context in this issue for this woman. She's a princess from another dimension or another planet or some sort of thing. But what's not clear, and I'll give uh, Jurgens a lot of credit for, is, is she in the wrong? Is are the people chasing her in the wrong John, you know, sympathizes with her. She's a young character. So he's going to see some, some of himself in her, of course. Um, but maybe, you know, she's in the wrong, she's doing something she shouldn't be. And her parents are just trying to, you know, rein her in, so to speak. So that aspect is still to be determined. The Lee weeks art and colors, um, from, uh, Brightweiser are done very, very well. Uh, I mean, Lee Weeks is just one of the best artists working today. There's, there's no doubt. So I, I'm cur I'm very curious. I'm very sucked into this story. Just have no idea where it's going to go. Um, it's been a, quite a few years since we've had the Lois and Clark series, but Jurgens hasn't missed a beat. This feels like it, you know, is a complete continuation of that. Feels the same in tone uh, in terms of era and pacing and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very curious, but. It is a bit of a slower burn, especially when you compare it to the fast paced action of the first story. So what are your thoughts, Rock? <laughs> it, it put a smile on my face. I, the only thing I wasn't, I'm not really a big fan of, I'm not a fan of Doombreaker. I, I, I wasn't a fan of the 30th anniversary story of uh, Doomsday. And uh, so Lloyd showing up being as Doombreaker, I, I'm not really interested in that. I, to me, it's a, it's a sort of a, I, 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 I like the more human side of the story that, that deals with just young John Kent and his, I mean, his conversation here. I mean, I love this opening scene, this entire opening scene with, uh, you know, this is Princess Gliana of the planet Plune, <laughs> who's basically fleeing, who's fleeing uh, uh, some enforcer who wants her to stand trial for treason on her planet. And John tries to help her, you know, he tries to help her by by destroying the tracker on her ship and unfortunately destroys the entire engine. And so it, he, the entire, the entire f ship is almost destroyed by his heat vision because he doesn't know how to use his powers. He's not in control of his powers all that much. And so, uh, ultimately the enforcer ends up showing up. I love the fact that John scree calls out his dad's name when he needs help. And of course his dad, you know, Superman knows, you know, I'm coming, you know, he, you know, he knows, the, he knows the sound of his son when his son's in trouble, you know, what have you gotten into now, John? And, and so it, this, this ish, this small, like, I don't know, what is it only like eight or some pages? It ends with Superman flying toward John and, uh, and this Princess Gliana, who he'll meet. Uh, and at the same time, all that's happening, coincidentally, and I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, at that exact moment, Lois is answering the door of the farm, and suddenly this Lloyd shows up, who's Doombreaker, and he looks like he's half transformed into sort of like a doomsday person, doomsday entity as it is. Um, so I'm curious. I'm curious. I, I, I hope we get more moments between John and Superman and, and Gliana, I don't, again, I, I, the Doombreaker thing, I, I always thought Jurgens did too much of that during the Triangle era. He would deviate too much from character work by getting drowned in plots that I wasn't really a big fan of, uh, because I'm not, um, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I loved all of Dan Jurgens' Dragon on Superman. There's a reason why I thought it dragged on for, a, for almost too many years when he was on Superman. Uh, and, uh, and I, so I'm, I'm good to see him back at the same time. 
I, I hope he remembers what, what people want to see and what people love in his convergence run. It was because of those moments between John and Lois and Clark. And so I hope we, we see more of that than, than Doombreaker. But, uh, but we shall see. Yeah, the last story. Uh, so it's Omen and Power Girl still running their, uh, I don't know, psychotherapy practice, I guess you'll say. This time, Kara, yes. Supergirl, shows up. She <laughs> seems to only be able to speak in Kryptonian and not sure why. Uh, Kara goes into her mind. And it's an interesting character exploration of both Kara and Power Girl. I, I think I'll give Leah Williams a lot of credit for sort of getting to the kernel of, of who these characters are in terms of what some of their hangups are. I know Rocky will talk about it more. Kara not feeling like she's part of the family uh, <laughs> or, or sorry, uh, Karen star power girl, not feeling like she's part of the super family and Kara maybe feeling too responsible, um, seeing herself as kind of the matron of the family. And then there are seeds planted for somebody who's coming after power girl, whose initials are J S. And I, I, can't think of who it could possibly be. Maybe you have uh, an idea of who it is. The, and then the black roses kind of reminded me of that uh, Alan Moore Superman annual. Obviously uh, that was um, a Mongol as the villain JS, anything to do with Mongol. So yeah, not sure uh, who that is. Um, the, the Marguerite Sauvage art is beautiful, both in line work and color as always, but you know, the weakness of her art, as we've talked about before, it just feels so static. It doesn't always flow as well as it should. But I'm enjoying this Power Girl series. It's a different um, it's a different take on her than we've seen before. So uh, I appreciate that. What are your thoughts? Uh, well, it's it's always nice to see Power Girl, but I, I, I'm, I can't say that I'm enjoying this. I, I can't. Uh, having said that, could it could it turn into something that's interesting? Yes. So it's one of those things where I don't really like the direction uh, at all, actually. However, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I, I've had it before where I've viscerally disliked uh, a, a beginning of a of a direction, and I've it's grown on me. So and and hopefully that's what'll happen here. I I, I chuckled I, I chuckled at the beginning of this because I mean it's it's literally. Uh, I mean, normally this would be a criticism of I said it, except for the fact that it's actually true. That you know, this is a, a, a group of women sitting in a room having tea, uh, and they're talking. So, <laughs> and everything takes place in the mind of Kara Zor-El. Now, having said that, it did get better. Okay, and uh, a couple of interesting things uh, I think are, are worth pointing out here that I, I think are interesting, and, and you kind of alluded to it, and that is that uh, to me it's an open question, and I I, I I would ask anyone watching this on YouTube. Uh, I mean, I. I'm a huge Power Girl fan. For the life of me, and Leigh Williams knows this, she said in an interview she's read different iterations of Power Girl, and she asked her editor, you know, which one is she supposed to go with, and they told her to do whatever she wanted, and clearly she's doing whatever she wanted. I mean, why are you making Power Girl a telepath uh, with substantially smaller breasts? I I, I don't know, but you're, you're definitely deviating from the source material, and, and that's fine, but now let's talk about her relationship with the Superman family. I like that power girl here actually says to, Zar to to Kara, she says, you know, I'm not a member of the Superman family. Where are all my invites? And, and what's a little odd is that, first of all, I agree with that uh, because power girl, I've never thought of her as a member of the Superman family. I, I've never thought of her and she's never been a member of the Superman family. Uh, I think in, in the minds of most people, even though we all know she's a Kryptonian from earth too, but that's, that's, that's a minor thing. I mean, you can get her into the Superman family, but if she's not a member of the Superman family, then why exactly is Power Girl wearing a new costume with a, with a red jacket that has a Superman S on it? She's, well, she's not a member of the family. I mean, clearly something must have happened. And, but it, it, it does lead to a more interesting question that Leigh Williams has maybe teased us readers with, and that is, why isn't Power Girl invited more? to the Superman family. Why Why doesn't Philip Kennedy Johnson have Power Girl in the living room in Metropolis when they're talking about Metallo? You know, why doesn't Power Girl introduce to the twins of uh, that Superman, that Lois and Clark adopted? I mean, obviously they're not that close. Uh, so it does sort of raise that question, are we gonna be seeing Power Girl actually interact with members of the Superman family since apparently she's a member of the Superman family. So that's an interesting question and we'll see maybe more moving forward. Um, uh, 
I, I don't like the telepathic angle, I, although I do find it interesting that somebody wants to, uh, has nefarious intentions with Power Girl and is, is, and the fact that she's a telepath now, they can only attack her through people that they perceive as being close to her, and they wrongly believe that Kara zor was close to her, and of course she isn't. Power Girl isn't really close to anybody, as far as I'm aware. So when you ask, you know, that whoever gave uh, Power Girl these black roses and said, Power Girl, can you sense the coming curtain call? And initials JS, I don't know who that could be. I, I, I have no idea. Uh, maybe, maybe it'll occur to me, but uh, I am kind of curious. But what, what I, where I'm a little... Uh, where I'm a little, where this is off-putting to me is just the whole psychology angle, psychologist giving psychiatric advice. Suddenly, Power Girl wants to be a psychiatrist. I mean, she's a billionaire scientist. This is completely out of left field. It still doesn't feel right to me. But, m m you know, but maybe it'll come around. I really hope this is temporary. If it's temporary, I guarantee you that nobody would buy this if this was an individual comic book. I mean, the, the only reason people are going to be coming aware of this because it's slammed in this because I would not be interested in this as a storyline. Power Girl, nothing about Power Girl cries telepathy. But enough of me being a negative Nelly on that point. I, I'm ready to be impressed if this story goes somewhere other than just, you know, telepathic counseling for uh, for fellow superheroes and we'll, we'll see how Leigh Williams uh, nails the landing and uh, you know uh, and Marguerite Savage's art is um, uh, it's probably ideal for this type of setting uh, uh, her backgrounds are non-existent I I and that that's probably my biggest criticism the color work is mostly done for the costumes not particularly a lot on the backgrounds I, I, I wasn't really impressed with you know um, just overall, it doesn't, it, it's, I don't know if it would, I guess it works for this type of story, but the truth is, is that the whole thing has just, this was very much a different feel for me. And fingers crossed, we'll see where things go. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, yeah, actually, you, I will say, I, I expected more of a rant from you for that. Well, no, I, I want to be fair. Like, no, I, I just want to be yeah. fair because honestly, I, I could go on a rant, but I would, honestly, I would just sound like an ignorant fool because i you know i mean i could get a little bit more period and fanboy on you here and uh, say some other things but the truth is i can respect what leigh williams is trying to do i think she is trying to do something different and hey i mean she's got justification to try something different after all because you know power girl hasn't been a it's been a character that's been hit and miss for a long time and you never know right you never know some you know this might end up being an interesting uh, storyline and i'm just trying to be objective but you know We'll see. Maybe I'll get a good rant next issue. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, all right. Up next, I'm not going to have a whole lot to say about this. Riddler, year one, issue number three, written by Paul Dano. Art is by Stephen Subic. Letters by Clayton Cowles. Uh, now, Paul Dano, he's the one that played the Riddler in the most recent Matt Reeves Batman movie. I never saw that movie. From what I saw of the Riddler, you know, in trailers and, and snippets of the movie here and there, didn't really care for this particular take on the Riddler. I will say this, Paul Dano, you know, some people were skeptical when he got announced as the writer for this, you know, oh, vanity project for an actor, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, he really inhabited the character, and apparently did a, a great job. He knows whether he talked about it with Matt Reeves or whatever. He knows what it took for the, the person, for that character to become the Riddler, right? Like what, what happened in his childhood, what happened in his formative years, whatever. He's doing a good job of conveying that. The problem is, Maybe because I haven't seen the movie or I don't care for this particular iteration of the character. I, I don't really care. I'm not invested in this version of the Riddler. So while it is an interesting narrative, and again, I give Paul Dano all the credit in the world for making it compelling because I did sort of get sucked in toward the end of this issue going, oh, okay, I can see what's going on. It's sort of interesting. I still don't really care. Like if I didn't read the next issue or the subsequent issues of this and never finished it, I, I wouldn't miss it. I wouldn't be like, oh man, I, I'm really disappointed. I never got to finish reading it. Um, Cause again, I, I just, I'm not invested in this version of the Riddler at all. So um, yeah, for me, it's, it's kind of a miss, but I don't think I'm necessarily the target audience for this. Just like I wasn't the target audience for that Batman movie, which is why I've never seen it. Um, and a lot of people might be like, what, what? you're not a, the target for a, a Batman comic book movie. Well, not, not that style of Batman comic book movie, not, 
not that dark and grim and gritty and what have you. Um, but like I said, Paul Dano's doing a good job. I think the art by Steven Subic uh, captures the tone of what Dano's trying to do really, really well. Uh, and so in terms of that, the narrative and the artwork are working really, really well hand in hand. But uh, what were your thoughts, Rocky? Yeah, the, the art's fantastic. I mean, really, the, the art really stands out here. The, the way that the artistically, the way the, the artist Stefan Subic, I think his name is, he, he it's really impressive. It is. I, I didn't like the Batman movie. And so I'm, I'm not picking this up because I didn't I didn't like the Batman movie. And I'm not a big fan of uh, I thought. I, I thought the Riddler wasn't the Riddler. It was the, uh, I, I didn't think Paul Dano did a good job as the Riddler at all. I guess I'm an outlier there, but he didn't, he, he wasn't a Riddler. He played, he portrayed the Riddler as somebody who doesn't really talk all that much and isn't really all that interested in a lot of riddles. And he has the most a ridiculous costume. I, I think it was a bastardization of the character on multiple levels. I thought the char- I thought the whole movie was too dark. It was too long. It was painful to watch. Uh, the only good actor in the movie, as I, I thought, was, you know, Penguin was adequate. And I thought the car was the best uh, part of the entire movie, uh, the Batmobile. Uh, and even that just made a lot of noise, uh, which, uh, so, yeah. And plus, this is superfluous. It's re- repetitive, I think, because when, you know, breezing over this, we know where this goes. We know how this ends up. So, uh, but I want to give kudos to, uh, because I don't want to sound... To, you know, Stefan Stefan Subek here. The the art really is fantastic. I mean, the way that this is that the layouts, the design, the page layout. I mean, this is really really good. Uh, and and so I'm sure the story. If I wish I was a fan of the Batman movie, because I'm sure this would be. You know, if you're a fan of the Riddler character as portrayed in the in the Batman movie, you would love this. But I'm not. As I said, I I hated it. I I I don't. I didn't dislike the Batman. I hated it. And I didn't like the Riddler portrayal. I think it's you know again. I so I'm just the wrong person to 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 prop this uh, this this issue up. And uh, I don't um, this entire the way DC marketed this is just plain brutally wrong. This should have been a, a black label, one stop uh, hardcover or or you know this should not be whatever this is five six issues. That this was this thing was just a marketing error. Uh, in my mind, but uh, but hey, I'm sure it has its audience, and I'd be interested to know what the sales were on this. I'll have to look it up because uh, uh, you know, I mean, I want Batman to do well, but uh, if it was up to me, the the Batman wouldn't be getting a sequel, and Matt Reeves would be out of a job. But that's uh, it's not up to me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are there is an audience for so. So first of all, I agree with you. Marketed horribly should have been black label. It also should have come out like a year. If this should have come out before the movie or maybe you coincide the final issue with the you know uh the when the movie comes out or or you know anyway should have come out a lot closer to the movie there are comic book readers i know whose opinions i respect that are loving this oh certainly raising it yeah left and right so um that i personally know uh that are really enjoying it that also enjoy the movie so hey great glad there's an audience for it um and they've, they've been impressed with what Dano's done as well. So uh, anyway, let's move on. Harley Quinn, number 27. Um, Who Killed Harley Quinn, Chapter 6, written by Stephanie Phillips, art by Matteo Loli and David Baldione, colors by Rain Barreto, letters by Anne World Design. Man, you can really tell when it's uh, Baldione on, uh, on the art. Not that the two art styles are, um, are really different. Uh, it's not jarring or anything, but the Baldion art feels just better, cleaner, more well executed, and it's gorgeous uh, and works really well for uh, for Harley Quinn. In terms of the story, man, this is going to be a wonderful issue for people that ship Harley and Ivy um, because that's all about Harley and Ivy and their relationships, the the love between them, sort of saving the day, which you could take as sort of corny or sort of cliche or what have you. But you know, again, credit to Stephanie. Phillips for doing something different. Don't know how many more issues she has. We know she's off the book. Maybe I, for some reason, the number 30 is sticking in my mind. So maybe there's three issues to go. Uh, or maybe this is her final one. I'm not really sure. But I, I don't really care about Harley's relationship with, with Ivy. I barely care about Harley herself. So again, I'm not the target audience for this, but it's well executed. A good balance of 
the Harley relationship with the zaniness of Harley and with the humor. Um, and Stephanie Phillips does a good job of using that method of breaking the fourth wall that Jimmy and Amanda used to use all the time with Harley. So I think this was well executed in, in those terms. Um, also, I sort of complained about, like, I'll never forgive Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo for creating the Batman who laughs last. Cause I think he's just such a derivative, horrible, stupid character. His character design is awful. I hate the Joker. Now you're, you know, mashing up Batman and Joker. Like I just, there's nothing I like about it, but because of its immense popularity, now we're getting, you know, laughs last versions of all the characters. So yeah, sure enough, the Harley who laughs last showed up and yeah, not long before we see the poison Ivy that last laughs. And I just, you know, it's a nitpick. I'm putting it aside and just enjoying this story for what it was. I was able to do that, but <laughs> I eventually we're going to get the Superman who laughs last. And at that point I, I just, I might lose it. But uh, anyway, what did you think of this? Well, there's a, there's a, there's a line of dialogue or actually a, a series of, uh, s s actually Harley goes on a rant here. She kind of, kind of sort of breaks the fourth wall, but not kind of. She, t she rants about bad endings and uh, Harley herself says that endings aren't that hard as long as you don't uh, undo years of character development or kill a lot of people with a dragon. You know, she's referencing Game of Thrones, and then she talks about, she makes a reference to Lost, about the terrible ending on Lost, and what have you. And I will say that, how is the ending? I mean, applying that logic to Stephanie, Philliams, uh, Stephanie uh, Phillips' resolution here of Who Killed Harley Quinn, Chapter 6. Six chapters, this dragged on way too long in my mind. But how did it end? Well, it, it ended with, uh, it actually ended, was there, was there any... Um, character development that was undone? Well, no. I can actually see Harley Quinn being uh, totally ignoring the fact that the Harley who laughs is a, is a, is a cold-blooded murderer because, of course, Harley Quinn has been a cold-blooded murderer in the past. So the fact that Harley Quinn would ignore the fact that the Harley who laughs is a cold-blooded murderer and think that all, all, all can be resolved because all Harleys love Ivy uh, and then, of course, all the all the Harleys in the story talk about their Ivies, and some Harleys even have more than one Ivy. And so, it, it would appear that in every aspect of the multiverse, every Harley Quinn has an Ivy, uh, which leads to my first criticism. And it's kind of a jokey one, but is it really the case that every ha a Harley in the multiverse would have an Ivy? I would think not. What's the likelihood of all of them having an, an Ivy as a lover? I would think that would be pretty slim. Also, the, the Batman who laughs w stood out from Batman because the Batman who, who laughs killed everything, everyone that he ever loved. Uh, and gre and gr egregiously. And the, the Harley who laughs, I would have thought would have probably eviscerated or killed her Ivy. Uh, but that, but that was, that's a little bit too dark and this being a Harley comic and maybe wanting to subvert expectations. Well, no, see all, all it takes to cure the, the, the Harley who laughs is the love of an Ivy who laughs or, or Ivy who never got to laugh or an Ivy who is basically captured and held in a tower on her world by a bunch of Joker like clowns who, uh, and the guard, the, the guard is, uh, like the, a darker version of Kevin. And so there, there was fun to be had here. Uh, it was, um, again, nothing, this is, um, I, I, the reason why I'm not a big fan of the Harley comic uh, in this iteration and the reason why my favorite was uh, the Lieberman run, which was basically Harley Quinn's first run, is that they, they took Harley more seriously and she was, she was, in fact, uh, treated like she was when Bat, Bat is basically a psychopath. She's 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 not just mentally ill. She's 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 psychopathic. She she's a killer, and I like her as a villain. And I always will. And I like Ivy as a villain, and I always will. But they're they're lesbian lovers now. They 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 love each other. They'll always you know we're always going to have the endings of them getting together no matter what. Uh, and they're going to be breaking up and then getting back together no matter what. They're always going to be good guys now or anti-heroes. They're always... So I, I think the ship has sailed for me for Harley ever being an interesting character. Same for Ivy. Um, I, unless it's it's going to be a Black Label story or uh, or just an Elseworlds tale because I'm not interested in Harley Quinn as, frankly, as a hero. Um, 
it's too bad we never got punchline wasn't written well enough. We could have gotten maybe a, a, an adequate replacement for Harley, but we're not getting that. And uh, so I don't mind this, this, but you know, what, what else can Stephanie Phillips do? I mean, what, what can she really do? I mean, she can't, you know, she was, she wasn't even allowed to use her uh, IV for the longest time. And when she does, she's got to use an IV from another, from another dark, from the dark universe. And she, you got to try to be funny. And then I don't know, she, at times she's trying to capture the, 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 the funniness of Paul Miotti and O'Connor and O'Connor, Amanda O'Connor's run. And then at other times she's forced to editorially link the, this, her Harley run to what's going on in the pages of Batman. And it's, uh, I think she had, I think she had some, some difficulties there. And I, I think she was given a very difficult task, but at the end of the day, uh, in fairness to this entire, her, her, her approach to the character, I just, I don't, I don't enjoy this, this, this interpretation of Harley overall. I think it's the least interesting aspect of Harley Quinn. And I think it's, you know, too much is, you know, unfortunately, the the popularity of the Harley Quinn and uh, Ivy cartoon, and this this, uh, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I love lesbians as much as any Purian fanboy, but maybe give it a rest already and, and give us some good stories instead of just, you know, let's get Pam, you know, Ivy and Harley together all the time. But whatever, that's uh, you gotta you gotta go where the money is, I guess, and the people people love uh, Harley and Ivy together. Yeah, I, and again, that's interesting to some people. I, I'm not a big Harley fan. I'm not a big Ivy fan. So, you know, whatever. Like, it, I might be even less of a fan of Poison Ivy than I am of Harley. So, if I'm wanting to see a relationship, Harley in a relationship that I think would be interesting to me, I'm probably going to choose, you know, somebody I'm more interested in. Uh, you know, I've, as much as I'm Batmaned out, I like the over in the Sean Gordon Murphy verse that Harley's with Bruce Wayne. That, I find that to be more interesting dynamic because I'm more invested in Bruce Wayne than I am in Poison Ivy. So I don't know who, you know, if I if I ship to use that term again, uh, somebody in the main DC universe with Harley, who would that be? Mm, I, I <laughs> Nobody even comes to mind, honestly. Booster Gold, maybe that would be really <laughs> yeah. codependent and frenetic and frantic. So I don't know, maybe more put her with more of a straight guy, like a Ted Cord might be interesting, but anyway, let's move on. Uh, up next. Oh boy. Detective comics. Uh, my turn to go on a rant here. Written by <laughs> Rob V. Dexter Ooh. Soy with Stefano, uh, Raphael and Miguel Mendoca are the artists. Adriana Lucas on colors, Ariana mirror on letters. Uh, and then there is a backup feature in detective, which continues to be written by uh, Cy Spurrier. Uh, the art in this particular backup, which is called Absolute, this is part one of three, it's by Casper uh, Wingard, and then Steve Wands uh, handles the letters. Um, I almost want to talk about the backup first. I liked it so much more. So you remember when I said I'm enjoying Punchline more, maybe because Punchline's not in it? Uh, it takes till page 18, till the comic is two thirds over, before Batman has more than four words. I, I'm not exaggerating. Literally four words, maybe five words. Enough, stop, head hurts. Those are his only four words until page 18. <laughs> what? What? I don't buy Detective Comics to read about all these other Orgum characters. I don't care. I don't buy Detective <laughs> Comics to read nonsensical gibberish coming out of the mouth of the Ten-Eyed Man. Like, I don't know when the Ten-Eyed Man became this, like, esoteric voice from beyond that's got all this wisdom wrapped up in the, the you know, indecipherable way that he talks. It was bad enough struggling through the Dan Waters, and I'm a fan of Dan Waters, but it was bad enough str struggling through the New World Order story from him with Ten-Eyed Man. Now we're getting Ram, Ram V. Like if there was ever a character suited for Ram V to write, in fairness, it is the Ten-Eyed Man, right? Because I'm finding Ram V, his right, I'm, I'm becoming less and less of a fan of him. Like everything he does, it, it feels like it's, it's pretentious. He's, it's trying to be so smart and so interesting. There's something to be said for telling a simple, straightforward story. This is not that at all. 
and it's detective comics and we get so little batman so and when we do get batman and this issue is a perfect example he has no agency at all finally when he starts starts talking jim gordon is smarter than him and is saying things that batman should already know then batman goes to visit oracle and oracle has all the answers and she's directing batman who the fuck is this batman character that ram v is writing because he doesn't resemble any bruce wayne or any version of batman we've ever had he doesn't know anything he's not intelligent he has again no agency like what the hell am i reading this is like the least formidable least intelligent bruce wayne i've ever read now the saving grace might be that you know we get way too much batman right now so if one of these wants to screw him up it doesn't matter so much if i want to read a good batman story there's any number of other good batman titles out there or at least adequate batman titles but this is not one of them this is awful i do not like it at all i'm struggling so much to stay invested it's it, it like when i see detective comics like i open up our press previews and i see detective comics there like i groan like I audibly groan, like, oh my God, to suffer through another issue of Detective Comics. It's like, I, again, it's nothing personal, but this is just not working for me in any way, shape, or form. I don't recognize this Bruce Wayne. I don't recognize this Batman. I'm sick to death. I've talked about it before about the retcons into Batman's origins or the origins of Arkham Asylum or the origins of Gotham City itself now. Like, this isn't fun. It's not entertaining and it's a chore to read. It's really, really not enjoyable for me. So I don't, I don't, I don't know, maybe I'm not being clear enough and I, I should articulate myself better, but uh, yeah, rant over. Like I, 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 this has been building up and I, I just, you know, I try to be objective, but I, I just can't with this title anymore. How many issues has it been going on? And yeah. Uh, I can't hear you, Rock. I think you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah. No, I was going to say I'll, I'll I'll contribute a little bit to your rant here uh, uh, before before we get to the the backup. But uh, this, I agree with you that one of one of the very frustrating things is you know the ten eyed man at the beginning of this. What a poor choice to put at the beginning of this because the Ten-Eyed Man was a very difficult character to understand his dialogue when, when he was in Arkham, what was it, Way of the World or what that was by Dan Waters. Uh, I mean, it yeah, was... New world, new world Order. New World Order. Yeah, and it was, that was, that was a very, um, that was a very deep and uh, concerted read and it, it's just a very poor choice to, to, to put here. Plus, why would Two-Face call a Ten-Eyed Man? He's got eyeballs on his fingertips. He's just a weird character. You're just, you, you've just thrown off a reader. Why would anybody do that? It's just, it just seems really, really foolish. Um, you know, and then, because basically Two-Face rescued Batman after last issue when, when Batman got beat up by the, by, by Gaul who can change into a wolf man or something, or maybe I've mixed my characters up. I, I don't, I, I don't remember and I don't care. Uh, and so here he is, he's now going to be, Two Face just rescues him, and apparently, apparently, Two Face or Harvey told his other half who that Bruce Wayne is Batman. I I always assume that Two Face knew that Bruce Wayne was Batman, but I, maybe I'm wrong on that. But it, okay, so now that Two Face knows that uh, Harvey told Two Face that uh, Batman is Bruce Wayne, so so Two Face threatens Batman that if you ever come at me again, I'm going to kill those you love. I don't know if that's much of a threat. He's in my view, he's always known in past storylines, but maybe I'm wrong on that. I, not that I really care, but in any event, we now we got the master or we got the Orgum family. Master Ar Arzen is is uh, apparently we are told that the Orgum family are building that their the crime rate in Gotham apparently is very low. Uh, Rene Montoya acknowledges that the crime rate in in Gotham City is very low. Commissioner Montoya doesn't have to worry too much about her job. Crime rate's lower than it's ever been. Thanks to the Orgums, because they're building and they're, they're bringing jobs and everything to Gotham City. Everything seems so hunky-dory. Even one of the officers tells uh, Rene Montoya, Commissioner, everything's fine. What are you worried about? And, and, um, and also, but 
so while everything's hunky dory, uh, Master Arzen he wants to continue with the master plan of using the Asmir to enslave psychologically enslave more citizens of Gotham, and uh, he's doing that under the city. And and we are finally introduced to another character, and that's Cheshire Cat, who is Shoes, who is actually Ch the Cheshire's daughter, who we met during Ram V's Catwoman run, and. And she is. She manages to escape because she's one of the she's one of the alley cats, the alley town people, sort of captured by the uh, captured by the Orgum family. And she's trying to escape. She's shot, and then ultimately we at the, the issue ends with Solomon Grundy, who we know from uh, Catwoman's uh, from Ramsey's Catwoman run. He, Solomon Grundy will no doubt protect the Cheshire cat, and maybe we'll even see Cheshire show up later in this issue. So I, I'm actually intrigued how this particular issue ends. Uh, the, the the last time, uh, I even like the idea of chaos theory, the geometric lines that, that Gotham was set up very specifically with geometric lines, with chaos theory and all this nonsense. Uh, but maybe it's not nonsense because I've been watching all these YouTube videos on the pyramids in Egypt and maybe the way the pyramids were structured and everything, the aliens sp specifically, you know, certain people specifically spaced all the pyramids a very particular way and there's a there's a there's a certain type of magical geometry even with sound and placement and everything and all this is what Ram V sort of incorporating and in how Gotham was created back in the early whatever 1700s because the Batman at the detective comics annual dealt with all that the the origins of Gotham City that maybe its original designs the Orgums had something to do with the original geometric design of the city and the layout of Gotham City that and that somehow it's only, some power play is only going to come to fruition centuries later, and that's why they finally returned to Gotham. And so, I I think maybe in a twisted way, I can kind of appreciate what maybe Ramvri was trying to say, or or, or or he's heading. But getting there is a, is a chore. It's wonky. The art doesn't is not particularly helpful, and the backups have never been particularly helpful. Although this backup, uh, which I'll let you you talk about now, uh, is perhaps better than some of the previous ones. So what do you think of the backup? Yeah, I enjoyed the backup. It's giving different motivation and explaining why, even though Mr. Freeze's uh, you know, wife has turned his, his back on him, again, it, it speaks very well. Good job by Simon Spurrier. It speaks very well to Victor Freeze's, um, I don't want to say psychosis, but just his state of mind, just his personality, the way he is, his, his rigidity, his inability to accept reality. You know, he couldn't accept that his wife was dying. Now he can't accept that his wife has rejected him. So it must be because cryogenics causes brain damage. So now he has uh, kidnapped the uh, psychiatrist that we've seen in previous Simon Spurrier stories, Me uh, Mead, can't remember what her first name is. Um, but uh, any, is it Barbara Mead? Anyway, uh, he's got her trapped and he's experimenting on her to try to figure out how cryogenics um, causes brain damage so he can then reverse it Annabelle Mead, that's her name. Uh, anyway, so he can reverse it and then uh, his, you know, the beloved Nora of Victor Freeze will be healed and returned to him. So, yeah, uh, Victor, you're crazy. You're a nut. It's not the problem. You're the problem. Uh, you, you know, the, I think whoever, whoever did that, Batman, uh, One Bad Day, uh, Victor Freeze or Mr. Freeze series did a, uh, or issue did a good job of explaining and it ties very well. This could literally be a sequel to that um just explains who, who victor freeze is and his rigidity and inability to you know accept his own shortcomings so uh the art by casper wingard uh like a lot of casper wingard art there's a lot of blues and pinks <laughs> but being that this is a, a free story the blue and pink actually works you know because it gives that sense of things being kind of cold and um and frozen and frosted over so yeah uh, it's not, you know, the greatest thing ever. Um, I still would prefer there not to be a backup at all, but this is one of those instances, rare instances, probably for the first time since, um, Justice League Dark, where, as a backup, where the backup is better than the uh, main story. And it's so ironic, right? Because that Justice League Dark story, if you recall, Rocky was written by Rom V. <laughs> Here we have Rom V writing the main story. Simon Spurrier doing the backup, and the backup's better. So, 
uh, I don't know, maybe it's the universe balancing out some sort of karmic scales uh, for Rom, Rom V who wrote a better story than the main story that Brian Michael Bendis was writing. So now in turn, Cy Sprayer is going to give us a more interesting story than what you're telling us in the main detective comics well, story. So yeah. anyway, what, what were your thoughts on the backup? Well, I, I didn't like the one bad day, Mr. Freeze story, and uh, but uh, but I could respect what it was trying to say. Uh, I don't. I I breezed over this. I spare your backup. I it was okay. I'm not. I'm. And I I actually found it as equally confusing as as the main story. In in so far as I'm not really sure what earworm has to do with anything, and earworm has to do what earworm has to do with anything, and. Uh, I, I like the main story made it clear that Mr. Freeze had actually set up a lot of the geometric grids and, and had set up a lot of the uh, what was underneath Gotham. And uh, I didn't really uh, it didn't really seem to build on that as, as well as I would have liked. And um, uh, and his still uh, I, I would have liked a little bit more sophistication with Mr. Freeze uh, beyond just once again the Nora scenario because he's he uh, he's resurrected Nora before in the past and we've gotten storylines of that already and so I'm a little bit uh, I remain I remain a little bit confused and I think these backups continue to do a, a great disservice to the story which quite frankly in fairness Ram V's story has gone off the rails as it is. Uh, you know, because I'm not, I'm not invested. I, I don't, I don't care how this detective comic story ends. It, it's, it's not moving the story forward. It doesn't tell us anything new about Bruce Wayne. It doesn't really. Uh, it might tell us something new about Gotham, but it's such a convoluted read. I can't recommend it to anybody. And uh, it's, it's extreme. It's, a, it's a very, it's a hard read overall. And the backups particularly with the, the, the different types of art. Uh, and this is a, a new artist on this backup, so it's slightly better. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, 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 it's really not particularly, not particularly uh, helpful. And I, lo I love your reference to Ram V doing the backup to, to Brian Bendis' uh, Justice League story. That, that's, that's so true. But at, at least those stories were disconnected. They weren't, weren't related to each other at all. Uh, but these are supposed to be, and that's a problem in my mind. But uh, I don't know. We shall see how it ends. Yeah, yeah, hundred uh, percent. All right. Up next, we have Tim Drake, Robin, number six, end of the first arc. Megan Fitzmartin handles the script. Riley Marsmo on art. Lee Luffridge on colors. Tom not Tom Napolitano on letters. This might have been the book where I expected the biggest rant from you. Actually, now that I think about it, uh, um, I will say first of all, I'm talking about the covers. The Tim Drake. A Robin cover by Dan Mora in my mind is is the best one, and I just now realized maybe why it invokes such a '90s feel for me, such a a, a feel of um, like that era of Tom Lyle and whatnot. It, they they're using that same trade that old school trade dress from his old you know from Tim Drake's original Robin series with the DC bullet and the the, the Robin logo looking the same. So. Um, I enjoyed this. I enjoy this idea of Moriarty as kind of a, a new sort of a clay face derived tangential villain who uh, is a foil for Tim Drake, who may be as, as smart as he is. Uh, most of the issue actually is action with a, a battle between Tim Drake and this Moriarty character uh, and then resolution and somewhat of a acceptance, a step forward for Tim Drake, I would say, in terms of accepting where he is now in his life. Um, he, you know, he was questioning it, whether he'd been making the right decision to be out on his own, live on the docks, that sort of thing. Um, and it definitely seems like he's taken a step forward, which I appreciate that Megan Fitzmartin is, is moving the character forward. I know this is not for everybody. I know there are fans of the Tim Drake Robin series, uh, the previous series, like I said, that, that aren't enjoying this. It's too much of a departure. They don't like the bisexual aspect of the character and that sort of thing. Um, to me, this makes a lot of sense with what we've had from Tim Drake in the past. Um, the clues were for this were there. doesn't necessarily mean it had to head this direction, but it's the direction it went and I, I am enjoying it. Um, and just like with uh, Harley Quinn, the Riley Rosmo art on this seems to be evolving and uh, he seems to be finding his footing with, uh, with drawing Tim. And yeah, I thought this issue was, was pretty solid. What'd you think? Well, I, <laughs> I could I could go on a rant, but uh, 
Uh, honestly, I just I, I just feel like ranted out at this point on this title. I, let me just I, I will focus on the positives and maybe get going to a little bit of a mini rant. I I, I the idea of a Moriarty, uh, a villain that because Tim Drake is known for whatever reason because he's he's maybe more of a detective than the other Robins. Uh, at least most of the time, he's got somewhat of a reputation as arguably being a little bit more of a detective than the others. And so that so him having a villain called Moriarty who ultimately is revealed here to be just basically an old man who's really good with tech and creating white disks that project physical manifestations. And then when they're destroyed, they become corporeal and then and then somehow used alchemy in order to manipulate the clay face. And that's why we saw clay face like a clay face like creature in a previous issue. That's what all this is. So this this Moriarty, this the idea that he has this, that this is a Sherlock Holmes versus Moriarty sort of uh, interplay I mean that as a concept, that's that's a, that's a good enough concept. I just I I just straight up hated the story, it, I and I, I disliked virtually every aspect of it, uh, from his from his from the setting, from the from the interpretation of Tim Drake. I I uh, and I I don't want to you know people want to get a good rant where you and I went back and forth. We, they can go to, I think on issue the previous issue five. You and I had a we had a, we, we we went at it pretty good. Uh, I just this doesn't feel like my Tim. You know this isn't doesn't feel like Tim Drake at all. That that this feels like a devolution of the character, not an evolution of the character. This isn't a moving forward. This is a moving backward. And and an, arguably this doesn't feel like a character I know anymore. And uh, and that's independent of his choice of partner. Um, and uh, so it's just it's just not my cup of tea. But but I I will say though I like the idea of him having a villain called Moriarty because in fairness, uh, while Fitzmartin is not my choice of writer, I don't think she's very good at writing this character. Uh, I I think that any I think other writers could be better at writing a, a mystery and it, and and writing stories where Moriarty challenges. Uh, Tim Drake, because following the chain of the events, the detective work that Tim Drake does from issue one to here, I mean, I challenge anybody to make sense of that because that was, that's just the gong show. It just was. And it, 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 it could have been, you know, uh, Fitzmartin is at the, you know, she's just starting in her career and I, and I'm, you know, maybe, maybe things will improve, but, uh, I, I would, I would like to see just more of a more, I would have liked to have seen more of a cohesive detective story that would have, uh, made me have more respect for Tim Drake. Uh, that than I did uh, because this just seems very wonky from a plot perspective. Uh, those who are fans of uh, his boyfriend Bernard and his relationship, all the power to you. I mean, that's I mean that's here and that's that that aspect of the story is certainly for for that audience and uh, that that's fine. There's there's and and next issue promises to be a date night. So uh, those of us who you know. Uh, like that the relationship between Bernard and Tim well there's going to be a date night next issue and uh, that will be explored I guess because you know I I don't know how uh, you know <laughs> there's there's so many ups and downs and and I think sort of laughable head scratching moments between Tim Drake and how 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 uh, Bernard can't figure out that Tim Drake is Robin is but in any event I it's just not my cup of tea, but I, I like the idea of Moriarty. I think that's good, and I think that's got a lot of potential moving forward, uh, but it's going to have to be in a different writer's hands, uh, in my opinion. And Riley Rosmo's art, is it is what it is at this point. I uh, it, This feels m less appropriate for Robin than, you know, I got used to his art with with Harley Quinn because Harley Quinn is just a zany, crazy character, but it, it just, it really doesn't work here for Robin. Uh, more and more I see Tim Drake's face. Uh, some of the images here, uh, just, it just, uh, it just doesn't work uh, for, for, for me, for me, All right, my artistic sensibility. Uh, but in any event, I, I will give a shout out to uh, a series called Deathbed, which was written by Joshua Williamson with art by Raleigh Rosmo. That was an excellent story. And Raleigh Rosmo's art was, I thought, very appropriate for that story. It's a Vertigo series back in the day. I just actually reread it uh, over the weekend here. So I'd give a shout out because I don't want to, you know, I understand art subjective. But uh, all in all, I've, uh, you know, maybe not a fan of this particular iteration of Tim Drake. Yeah, fair enough. Um, not every comic is for every person, as we know. And and to be clear, I I don't know that this is the direction I would have chosen either, but it's the direction we have. And you know, I like I said, I think there were hints 
in the past or, or things that have happened in the past that could be interpreted to have led Tim Drake in this direction. Yeah. Would I prefer the other style Tim Drake that we previously had? Yeah, I would. But I could say the same thing about what James Tynan did with Tim Drake and his detective run. But, you know, nostalgia is a powerful thing. And I love that Robin 90s series. And that's still my favorite version of Tim Drake. So, uh, all right. Up next, we have a Shazam anthology called Shazam Fury of the Gods special. Shazamily Matters. A ton of stories in here. Billy Batson and the Shazamily in Door to Death, written by Zachary Levi, uh, who plays uh, Billy Batson Shazam in the uh, in the movies. Um, Art is by Freddie Williams II, colors by Andrew Dollhouse, letters by Dave Sharp. Darla stars in Darla's Keepers, written by Faith Herman and Amanda Dybert. Art and colors by Erica Henderson, letters by Josh Reed. Pedro in the Big Game, written by DJ Cotrana. I think he's the DJ is the one that plays Pedro in the movies. Um, Tim Seeley's the co-writer on that. Arts by Jorge Corona, colors by Sarah Stern, letters by Pat Broso. The Shazam Family in Crocodile Catastrophe, written by David S. Sandberg, who's the one that direct. I think he directs the movies or wrote them. Uh, one of the two, maybe both. Uh, Scott Collins co-writes and does the art for that. Colors are by John Kalish, letters by Dave Sharp. Eugene stars in Time Out, written by Ross Butler and Josh Trujillo. Art and color by Andrew Aurelian. Letters by Wes Abbott. Mary in Darla's Birthday, written by Grace Caroline Curry. Art by Damian Fulton. Colors by Nick Filarde. Letters by Justin Birch. Freddie in Dogtown and Blue Boy, written by Adam Brody and Kenny Porter. Art by Mike Norton. Colors by Alan Pasalacqua. Letters by Farron Delgado. And then finally, Billy Batson in Leadership Qualities, written by Henry Gaden. Art by Scott Godlewski, colors by Alex Guermez, and letters by Seda Tenemofante. Main covers by Jim Lee, and it's amazing. Um, I think all of these stories are fun. They're very new reader friendly. I haven't seen any of the Shazam movies, but I do think that this kind of captures the tone from what I've seen of the movies and trailers and whatnot, and I think what they're trying to go for, family-friendly feel. I also think these stories would or could possibly draw in viewers uh, or fans of the films and hopefully turn them into comic fans. Other than that, I don't have anything to say about any story in particular. No, no story stood out head and shoulders above the rest. I thought they were all solid. I thought they were all entertaining. For the most part, the art's pretty good, some better than others. I think Freddie Williams' second on that first story art is really probably the best or my favorite of the of the um, anthology. And yeah, like I said, that Jim Lee cover was uh, was fantastic. So uh, don't really have much more to say than that. It's fun. It's lighthearted. New reader friendly, like I said. You don't need to know anything about Shazam or the Shazam family going in to uh, to hit the ground running on this. So what do you think? It was all right. I, I, I skim read this. So it's, it's 90 pages long. Uh, I actually did get um, – I'm I'm getting the movie. I'm getting the movie uh, poster cover of this. So I am actually buying the physical copy of this because I – I have this naive hope. I, I bought all the covers for Black Adam and I bought the action figures and I, I'm going to buy the action figure, McFarlane action figure of Shazam on this. I have this ridiculous vain hope that there's going to be a DC movie that actually becomes, you know, well received. So I'm, I know I'm a glutton for punishment, but uh, that's just who I am. I love DC. Um, I, I, ironically enough, I'm not, I've always had some, a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a uh, disagreement with interpretation of the character of Shazam. I, 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 the way Zachary Le Levi plays him, the whole idea of like playing him like Tom Hanks big where an adult, you know, you know, a, a young boy's mind trapped in the mind, you know, in the mind of an adult. That's not my iteration of Shazam. Shazam has the wisdom. Uh, you have the soul of Billy Batson, but you've got, you've got the wisdom and you can still talk like an adult. You can still be a, as intelligent and wise. And uh, you just happen to have the soul of a child. And that's not way the, the way the movie has gone. Uh, that's not the iteration that they did. I understand why, but uh, there's there's also too many characters. The Shazam family. That's not what the movie should be. I think that was a huge mistake. It should just be Shazam. Black Adam should be in this movie, but you know whatever. Um, I also think I, I don't like the idea of having uh, movie actors write comics. I, they, they should have comic book writers write the comics uh, and write these types of stories. Uh, but. Uh, uh, but th this, these are okay. But these really feel like it's written for a younger audience. In, in my mind, it was these are adequate, mediocre, 
Uh, art's fantastic uh, uh, for the most part. I mean, there's some where it's generic and stuff, but you know, again, I I don't see people being pulled to comic books if they're going to pick this up. Straight up, they won't <laughs> because these are uh, these are okay but they're not great. And uh, maybe I'm just being a little bit harsh. I'm not going to go through the stories. There's 90 pages here. Uh, but uh, I'll just say that uh, uh, in James Gunn, I will trust. And, uh, <laughs> you know, once this Shazam Fury of the Gods movie is completed and it's done, we can put it past us and move on. I don't think many people are going to be missing uh, Shazam Fury of the Gods when this finally leaves us. Uh, but... Uh, but who knows? I'm 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 gonna be getting the action figure because I'm a fool, and uh, you know it, it, it looks kind of cool. And I like you know McFarlane knows what he did. What he, he knows how to do a good action figure. Yeah, he does. The argument could be made the guy's more influential as an action figure maker than as an artist. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's toys. So anyway, uh, all right. Up next, Blue Beetle Graduation Day number four from writer Josh Trujillo. Adrian Gutierrez is the artist. Will Quintana on colors. Louis Gut. Uh, on Katoni on letters. This is just a whole lot of fun. It has been throughout. Uh, we saw last issue sort of ended on a cliffhanger with uh, a couple of Jaime Reyes's friends heading to Palmera City, bringing along Fadeaway, who is his self-professed uh, nemesis. Certainly, I don't know if that Jaime Reyes has a, a nemesis per se, but certainly uh, somebody that he's he's fought against and, and somebody that he shouldn't trust and does in this issue to his detriment. So there's a lot going on. It's a lot of fun. The thing that stands out to me is how Trujillo, even though he's writing a Jaime Reyes that is relatable and heroic, he's also writing him as, as flawed, right? Like he's young, he makes mistakes that a young person would make. They're totally believable and he gets called out on him and his reaction is also very real and very relatable so i'm enjoying this i think the artwork is fantastic there's a youthfulness to it um i mean this is a perfect example and, and not to you know uh, beat up on other books but it's a perfect example of getting the tone of the story tone of the narrative and the style of art matched up well right as opposed to something like batgirls uh, but adrian Gutierrez is giving us this very youthful, energetic, exuberant style. That's also the story, the, you know, the tone of the story that Josh Trujillo is giving us. So it it, it works. Um, and there's even some ink splatter on the page here or there. And I didn't I didn't mind it. I didn't mind <laughs> it. I noticed it, but I, I didn't mind it because again, it, it it suits the tone really, really well. So um, we've gotten a few new beetles um introduced in this yellow beetle dynastus green beetle which i don't know that we've seen the name of yet um that are you know related to jaime in terms of the scarab coming from the reach or the horizon or what have you you know more closely related to jaime than jaime is to you know ted cord who obviously doesn't have the the scarab and uh, doesn't have any power so uh, that's interesting as well that trujillo is building on the, the mythos of the of the beetle family as it were uh, though i do tend to agree with you rocky there's too many families at dc not everybody needs a family uh sometimes it's okay to get back to you know just one green lantern just one superman just one batman um but anyway uh, i'm enjoying this and uh yeah i I, don't, I haven't heard a lot of feedback on this from other uh other reviewers so i'm not sure how well it's being received but i'm enjoying it so anyway what do you think yeah, you know, it's. Uh, I would never have uh, picked up this uh, series of if we weren't reviewing it, and I'm kind of glad I am because it's actually, um, actually not bad. I'm I'm actually pleasantly surprised. Uh, we are kind of going Power Rangers on this because we're getting we we got the Green Beetle and the Yellow Beetle. The the Green Beetle, as far as I can tell, is named uh, the Green Beetle is Windtide, and Yellow Beetle is Dynasties, and uh, you know Ted Cord and his sister Victoria Cord who we met uh, a couple issues ago, uh, they're basically looking for the Green Beetle. And uh, Ted, uh, Ted Cord is worried that uh, Jaime Reyes uh, and uh, that his connection to the Blue, blue Scarab uh, that he calls Keiji, Keiji Da, has, uh, maybe, it's been, uh, may maybe it's been severed somewhat or maybe it's adversely affected. Um, 
Jaime uh, and his friends end up meeting uh, meeting up with Fadeaway, who is one, of course, you, as you mentioned, is one of the villains of Blue Beetle. And his name is Louis uh, Le- Leo Lamont, and he's the grandson of the Fadeaway Man. And he's actually, he basically says he's looking for the cloak of Cal- Calgiolastro, uh, or, or pardon me, he he has the cloak of Calgiolastro, he's got invisibility, flight powers, and and essentially, he's looking for his grandfather was a villain, always stealing and looking for artifacts of mystical origin. And and uh, essentially, the fadeaway fadeaway claims that he wants to find some of these artifacts and return them to their families. And that one of these artifacts is located at Court Industries, and that Victoria Court has one of these artifacts. And the idea being that you know this is a bad thing that you know these artifacts should be kept with the families and. And ultimately, the story ends up with with Ted, with uh, Jaime Reyes, sort of being manipulated by Fadeaway, and his and Fadeaway also manipulates his friends, and they break into Court Industries, and they they find a satchel that is ultimately stolen, and ultimately they he ends up freeing accidentally freeing uh, both Beatles, the uh, Dynasties, the Yellow Beetle, and. Uh, Wintide, the Green Beetle, is still missing, and we have to remember that the Reach is out there, that the Reach is this uh, alien race that wants to destroy the planet, and there's a faction of the Reach called called the Horizon that apparently are the good guys of uh, who are re- a rebel faction of the Reach, Reach that want to destroy the Reach, and uh, apparently Dynasties is one of these. Uh, this Exile Mora is she works for the the for the horizon and she wants to even though she likes Jaime she she feels that you know you have to you know we got to prepare the earth for the horizon coming and so you got to wonder are the horizon although the the rebe- sort of like the rebel alliance against the empire being the reach are the horizon just as bad as the the reach i mean wh- what are the motivations of the you know what's the true motivations in the agenda of the horizon even though they're the rebel alliance battling against the reach and all these scarabs, we got the blue scarab and a yellow Arab uh, scarab and a, and a green one. How do these all come into play? And we know that there's potentially perhaps more different colors of, of scarab because we're probably going to, uh, you know, so that's going to come into uh, the fray somewhere. And we know that uh, at, at the end here with the, the two, uh, with dynasties, the yellow beetle and Wintide, the, the green beetle now being loose, uh, Batman finds out about it, and we, we now we now know that next issue we're going to have Shazam and uh, Green Lantern, um, and the and I'm assuming Wally West, the Flash, and Cyborg are going to come on the scene to try to uh, try to address and to do battle against uh, Yellow Beetle and uh, the Green Beetle, I guess. And and they Batman says, "Don't let Blue Beetle interfere." So th- things are really heating up here. And uh, you've got to remember, Starfire has been part of this too, and Starfire has been sort of like a quasi mentor to Jaime Reyes, as as well as Ted Cord. And Victoria Cord is kind of a wild card. She's the sister of Ted Cord, and she basically says to Jaime, "Look, there's a reason why we stole all these artifacts. We they're dangerous artifacts. Better to we were keeping them safe in Cord Industries here, so these these families, some of these are criminal families, so they they wouldn't have them anymore. And now you just help them escape with the very artifacts that we were, I was studying. So thank you." very much Jaime you really blew it and so Blue Beetle is feeling really low right now <laughs> and uh, Batman has uh, he's got a pretty good reason to be upset and there's a reason why Batman at the end of this issue is sending Shazam Green Lantern and the Flash and Cyborg and another character I don't recognize in to maybe uh, uh, fix things up so uh, this was kind of a, a fun issue I like this and I'm really curious to see how where this is going to go this is actually in terms of I actually feel the gravitas of this. I, I feel that there's more at stake here than in most comics I'm reading. I feel that this is more at stake than than I did when I read Lazarus Planet, ironically enough. But yet no one's talking about Blue Beetle because it's, well, because it's Blue Beetle. <laughs> but I, this is actually a, a decent story coming up here and we uh, that we're in the middle of and we got two issues left. Yeah, that's what's so interesting. Uh, I could see a whole family of, uh, you know, again, not to... <laughs> <laughs> Say that DC needs more families, but whole family of uh, of Blue Beetles, Rogues Gallery for Jaime, and I mean, let's let's be fair. As much as Josh Trujillo is a fan of him, even Ted Cord at the height of his popularity, you know, he's not an A lister. So, <laughs> you know, the fact that Blue Beetles had a couple of solo series is is actually kind of surprising, and a credit to DC that sometimes they'll let you know some of their lesser characters uh, have a bit of a run. 
Uh, anyway, let's move on. Uh, up next, we have Sandman Universe Dead Boy Detectives number three. It's from writer Pornsack Pichichote. Jeff Stokely is the artist. Craig Tillier does the inks. Miguel Morto on colors and Hassan Atzman Elhow on letters. Um, again, I, I have no real uh, history with the Dead Boy Detectives. This story started off kind of interesting to me. It feels like it's meandering uh, a little bit. Um, there is some um, um, emotionality and some interesting um, character dynamics between these kids. Um, I mean, the fact that they're all dead and at such a young age and they lack experience, you know, life experience, there's an, something interesting to be explored there. I don't know that it's fully being... Um, kind of mind for for story ideas right like if you get killed as a kid you don't have a lot of life experience but then you your existence could be you know decades and decades and decades even longer than people that that you know live to an age where they have you know experience and wisdom but yet somehow you don't really gain experience or wisdom that that's so, so there's like i said there's something interesting there like haven't some of these ghosts been around for a really long time you think they would kind of have matured a little bit, but yet they still come across as sort of immature and inexperienced. And, and I find that to be interesting. The story itself in terms of what's going on with these different Thai demons and you know whatnot and that sort of mythology, it, it sort of misses the point for me, maybe it's just because it's not my heritage and I don't have any context. Um, but this is interesting enough that I'm, you know, I, I plan on obviously continuing to, to read it and I am curious to see how it all plays out. So uh, what were your thoughts, Rocky? I think you're muted. Oh, it's my turn to be mute, mute myself. Uh, this issue uh, was, uh, I felt it was a little bit disjointed in a way in that I, I, had, to, I had to read it a couple times to get a handle on it. I, I kind of share your sentiment. There's, there's something, it's a little bit odd to get a handle on these sort of like these dead boys, these immortal boys who at some, don't they mature? Don't they learn something as they go? They, they have their own experiences. What about the other children as well? Well, we get kind of hints of that here. It starts off, I, th I, th I thought, in a very confusing way. Uh, it, it shows us Thessaly, the, the, the witch girl, uh, who uh, we know from previous issues, uh, although we don't know enough about her. We're not told enough about Thessaly, quite frankly, but she's basically, she's a witch girl, and she was she's captured by these little golden boys that were basically fetuses that were given these dead, these fetuses that women gave birth to that were born dead and then went through some ritual and became and and become these little golden boys that sort of attack and and and, and they capture Thessaly and I I don't really understand I, I didn't quite understand their involvement here it's we we know that all, all these dead children they're they're investigating sort of uh, they're investigating the death of essentially one of one of their teachers and uh, that he died in the first issue and Charles Edwin and Charles who are the dead boys Edwin or Charles is in love or used to be in love with a girl in, in the past uh, used to be in love with this girl in the past whose uh, name was Crystal and uh, this Crystal uh, grew older and eventually they parted ways and of course the dead boys being immortal and dead they don't age and so that's a problem and so Edwin feels sorry for Charles because Charles has this past where he's, he know, Charles knows what it's like to be in love with a girl and lose that girl because they're dead boys. Uh, well, Charles also loves, uh, seems to love this Tanya character, this dead girl. And, but, uh, while Charles is incapacitated by these fetus creatures, Edwin is, has feelings for this Tanya character as well. And it ends up that this Tanya character is actually a knack mother. And if you fall in love with a knack mother, then knack mothers are cursed. And if you fall in love with the knack mother, you inherit the curse. curse. So it would appear as if both Edwin and Charles, by the end of this issue, both have feelings for this Tanya girl, which is a problem because she's a knack a knack mother, and she's cursed. Meanwhile, the central emotional core of the story has to do with bullying, and it, and it has to do with uh, some, the, the story of, of Melvin and the, these other characters who were basically born uh, 
you know, Melvin was, he died as a young boy. He was killed by bullies. And so he, he can turn into a serpent. And, he, and when he turns into a serpent, he wants to sort of avenge and defend other kids that are victims of bullies. And he finds himself sort of attacking this one this one character who is whose father asks him not to hurt him and um i, th I thought it was a little disjointed i can uh it, it it was wonky to me it was just wonky to me it was it um it was like um uh, emotionally there's there's too much going on uh between the different scenes and the thessaly the thessaly scene and and this uh, these attacks by these fetuses really kind of threw me off uh I, what I did get a handle on was apparently this Melvin character, when he turns into a serpent, he apparently these dead people, these dead children do have the ability to defend themselves against these, these, I guess, attacking fetuses, but they're not really sure how they can. Um, I'm, I find this very hard to articulate and explain, <laughs> but uh, um, I, I thought this issue unfortunately went off the rails a little bit because pick a shoot the the writer there. I, I think he, he I think he lost. I think he didn't. I think he could have done a better job on this because I'm not I'm not really getting the handle on terms of exactly what happened, what the history of these children. Uh, the, the, the stuff that I'm most interested about, and I think you are too, is that he's not really focusing on that aspect of it. Uh, because it is interesting that they're immortal and they, what do they do? What do you do when you're an immortal dead child and you have feelings and how do you love? What's the price of love? Uh, do you, you know, Edwin and Charles, they're dead boy detectives. The only thing they have is each other. What happens if that's not no longer enough? I'd like to see more of that explored than, than the sort of esoteric narrative that's playing out here. But but, you know, I want to give some props here. I, I'm still invested in the story. I'm just really curious to see how it's, how, where it's going to go from here. But I suspect it might go in a direction that I'm not a big fan of. But we'll see. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, yeah, I agree with what, what you're saying. It, it was felt more focused in the beginning, and now it feels like it's meandering a, a bit. So, uh, all right. Up next, and finally, I should say, uh, Stargirl, The Lost Children, number four, from writer Jeff Johns. Todd Nock is the artist. Matt Herms on colors. Rob Lee on letters. Jeff Johns does it again, you know, showing that uh, veteran comic book writing skill, much like Mark Wade, sums everything up in a way that doesn't feel repetitive, doesn't feel derivative, uh, and, and gives more information about what's going on, maybe for the, for the first time, understanding how these lost children were pulled out of time, understanding... Um, you know, how they might be able to escape and using Corky Baxter as sort of our, uh, our expositional character to explain to the kids who they are and, uh, you know, why they were pulled out of time and, uh, or how they were pulled out of time and what have you. Um, and we're teased that there's going to be a big bad that's going to show up at the end. And I, that, that, again, fantastic job, te you know, technically pacing the comic from John's because I found myself wanting to skip to the end, right? Let me we get to that last page and see who this big bad is. I had no idea who, who to expect. And I also was wondering if they would do that comic book um, thing that they do so many times where you actually only see the big bad from behind just as a silhouette or a shadow and you got to wait till next issue. Now that's <laughs> usually what, what it is, right? Like either on the very last page, you see who it is or the very first page of the next issue. You know, like think about Wolverine, right? 181, everybody considers his first appearance, but he actually shows up on the very last page of 180 as a splash page. Well, this one, we have the, the big bad show up and it's definitely not who you would expect. Uh, it's our man and not an hour man, not a version of our man. I'm familiar with like, this is futuristic iron man, uh, our man. Like what, what the heck's going on? How is that going to play out? So this is a very competitive, mysterious narrative uh, or compelling rather. Um, and mysterious narrative from John's and the artwork. You know, I talked about from the very beginning with the first issue, how perfectly Todd Nock is suited with his dynamic, youthful art style to draw this book with all these young characters. The color works fantastic for Matt Herms. Um, yeah, I mean, the only, the only thing I don't like about, like, I wish this book came out every two weeks. That's how good Stargirl and the Lost Children is. Like, it is just, this is what DC Comics is supposed to be. This is the feel that DC Comics should have, where it's, you know, you, you have interesting characters, you have gorgeous art, 
you have intriguing and compelling stories, and it feels like it's going somewhere instead of just retreading on the same old ground. So uh, I can't say enough good things about Stargirl and the Lost Children. It's it's very impressive work from Johns and Todd Knox. So what were your thoughts, Rocky? Well, uh, what I enjoyed the most about it was we got some explanation from Corky Baxter as to what's going on and how this sort of ties into the larger events of uh, Flashpoint Beyond and uh, even tying into Doomsday Clock and, and Rebirth and the Divine Continuum, which we haven't seen since the beginning of Flashpoint Beyond. And in typical John's fashion, while it can be a little, might seem a little bit convoluted at first, he explains it in the most simplistic way that he possibly can. And that is, you know, he talks about the divine continuum, of course, the acronym DC for DC Comics. So there's, there's synchronicity there. Uh, there's a difference. There's the omniverse and hypertime. So space and time are broken up with the omniverse and hypertime. Under the omniverse, we got the multiverse and then the metaverse, which is Earth Zero. And that's, that's the mainstream DC universe. We got the dark multiverse and we got the Spear of the Gods. And then under hypertime, we have limbo and the vanishing point. And essentially, to oversimplify this, I will simplify it further. These children, these lost children, have been lost in limbo. So they've been lost in time, but they've essentially been in limbo. And they were taken from limbo by the Time Masters. And uh, un unfortunately, when they were taken by the Time Masters, it, they were taken by the Time Masters with the goal of putting these children back in the correct timeline so that they would no longer be forgotten. But unfortunately, they were taken. Uh, the Childminder took them. And ultimately, Childminder is selling them off to, I guess, the highest bidder. And the buyer that shows up at the end ends up being this Our Man. And the, the real question, you know, that, that's still a central mystery is, who is, 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 if Our Man is the central bad guy, or maybe he's not, maybe it's per Degaton, because that's what we all thought it was, but maybe that was too obvious. If Our Man's the central villain, what's the motive here? What's, uh, what, what's the motive? Why is it so important to have these lost children plucked from history and have their, and have the people, and have the beef be forgotten? Why is that so important? And why is why is this our man who ends up being perhaps the central bad guy? Why is it so important to him that 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 these children are lost from history? And what secrets do they hold? And that uh, that is you know that that is necessary for for the for the origins of the JSA, because we know that with the Justice Society of, of America, is, we're up to issue two, we know that the Huntress from the future is, is in the past with the JSA. And now she, so what? How, how does that play out here? Because we got lost children, we got, we got uh, machinations going on with the Justice Society, uh, and we've all this flowing out of Flashpoint Beyond. We know that Batman, we know the Flashpoint Beyond Universe, we know the Flashpoint Universe exists because of what Batman did. He preserved it in that snow globe. But in, in preserving it, that caused some chaos as well. And that caused a disruption in the time stream that the Time Masters were trying to fix. In particular, Corky Baxter is, is a very somewhat, I don't know if he's a future narcissist or a, I, I think Corky Baxter could give Damian Wayne a run for his money in terms of narcissism or, or at least on the surface. Corky Baxter has a very inflated opinion of himself. And of course, Corky is going to save everybody. And um, it's, it, it's very well done. The voices of all these children are well kept here. And, you know, it's funny, we, we, we just gave sort of a, we, we made an observation about the dead boy detectives about, well, what do you do if you're, you're a kid for so long? At what Do you not mature psychologically, even if you don't grow up physically? That's one of the questions I have about these children here. Yeah, these children have been on this island for a long time, and yet, it's, strangely enough, they're still wearing their costumes. <laughs> they still look like the costumes are clean. They still, still, you know, I think of Lord of the Flies, you know, are th these kids still get along with each other and haven't they been on the island for decades? Or I guess some of them have only been on there for a few days or a few weeks, or maybe just a few days for them have passed. And then they're going to, they're, it's been established. Apparently Corky Baxter says we, that if we do it right, they can return them all to their timeline and people will remember them. And in order to do that, they got to attack the castle that the child minder is in and free Judy Garrick, who is the long lost daughter of Jay Garrick, uh, the just GSA Flash. So, you know, again, just add it. You know, Todd Knox's art is fantastic. The number of players that he, I mean, I mean, look, George Perez is, is unbeatable at drawing a lot of characters on a page, but kudos for, to, to Todd Knox here for, you know, 
saying, hold my beer. I'm going to do my damnedest to draw as many awesome characters on a page as I can. And he does it very well. He does a scene where the, all the kids are, are in a cave uh, and they're just talking to Cor as Corky Baxter tells them their story. And then there's another scene at the end where all of the, uh, all of the children are attacking are attacking the castle where, or, or the fortress where uh, Judy, uh, Judy Garrick is being held hostage. And they yell, charge as the ring. It's an awesome scene, awesome art. I, I love they're running across a bridge and there's these floating Humpty Dumpties that, that are attacking them. And it, <laughs> it looks really good. It's a beautiful page. Uh, you, this is just a, this comic is a joy to read. And why it can be a little bit convoluted, maybe a little bit challenging for, for brand new DC readers. If you're a DC reader with any amount of years under your belt, I think you'll find something to really enjoy with it. Yeah, again, I couldn't agree more. Um, it, it just has that classic uh, DC feel, more 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 so maybe than anything that uh, the DC is putting out right now. So, although you know, Mark Wade content com does come close. Uh, all right. In addition to those books that are out this week, there are a couple of other single issues. Uh, let's see. We have Batman: The Audio Adventures number five, and then DC RWBY. I don't know if that's pronounced Ruby. Uh, or not, it has a, a number one that's out. And then Blue Beetle Graduation Day continues its uh, Spanish and English uh, releases coming out on the same day as well. In terms of collections that are out this week, Action Comics Volume 3, War World Revolution trade paperback, which collects the uh, final chunk of the War World story from Philip Kennedy Johnson and Action Comics. Batman the Imposter, uh, which is written by uh, Matthias Tomlin, who wrote the Batman movie is out this week uh aquaman and the flash void song which was a, a mini series that came out earlier this year with aquaman and flash teaming up definitely that one's definitely out of um out of continuity uh written by jackson lansing and colin kelly still very very good uh with uh, really great art by vasco gregev and then shazam thundercrack trade paperback which collects uh some shazam stories that oh no i'm sorry that's a that's in the ya line um the, and it's it's brand new it doesn't collect anything it's uh, 160 pages so those are the collections that are out this week um like rocky said at the beginning sort of a mixed bag um it's really in my mind i don't want to say sad i don't know what the right word is disappointing i guess that the namesake title of the entire publisher was the worst book of the week. <laughs> yeah, detective. Like, wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm just really struggling with that uh, that title. So, uh, anyway, yeah. what's your book of the week? What's the best book of the week for you, Rocky? Uh, well, I, yeah, my book of the week. Uh, well, I was gonna go. I, I don't want to. I'll probably end up picking yours, but uh, I I gotta go with uh, I gotta go with Human Target because it was just uh, I just I, I enjoyed it that much. It was a beautiful ending to to that story, uh, and uh, it was it was satisfying uh, as a reader. I felt satisfied, and I loved the ending. And he nailed he nailed the landing, and I I just I, I quite thoroughly enjoyed it. Well, yeah, I can't. I can't pick anything else. We we're going to, you know, I don't usually like picking the same, same book cause I like to give you guys a variety, but yeah, there's no way I can pick anything other than human target. It was a great final issue. It was a great series, just perfect, perfect example of the power of comics and sequential storytelling. I'll give an honorable mention. If I couldn't pick human target, like if we had some rule that said, mm -hmm. you know, we can't have the same pick, I would pick star girl and the lost children that comes in as my runner up. But, as good as that is, and it's good, it's great, it's still a distant second place to <laughs> Human Target. I mean, Human Target, we're not talking about, you know, one of the best books of the week. We're talking about one of the best comics of the year, yeah. of maybe the last decade. Like, Tom yeah, King's I, got stiff competition up against yeah, himself. That's, that last 10 years, that's that's quite the th – I really like it. it. It's it's memorable to me, but it's it's definitely going to be an evergreen. It's it's going to be on the charts for, for quite for quite a while. Uh, yeah. And what will be interesting is will it put 
Christopher Chance. We'll put human target enough on the radar that they'll bring him back in like regular DC continuity with a human target. Cause that's the thing. Like if you bring him back and you give him a, his own series in the main DC continuity, it's not at all like you're not, Tom King's not going to write it. You're not going to get Greg Smallwood to draw it. So would it have the same audience? So it's kind of interesting as uh, yeah. critically acclaimed as Mr. Miracle was, it didn't bring Mr. Miracle back, at least not the Scott free version. You know, yeah. we got the Silo Norman version, which actually ended up being a, a big surprise how great it was. Um, we also haven't seen any Adam Strange, and you would think that there would be, maybe there's just not enough Adam Strange out there, right? Like a clamoring for, no, restore the honor of Adam Strange. Give him a regular series where he's a true hero again, instead of what yeah. Tom King <laughs> did. To I, I would love, I'd like to see a time travel tale where Fire and Ice go back in time to save Christopher Chance and uh, have it all be zany and have the justice... Justice League International do it and have it. Uh, I think I, I think it would just be fun. I just because I find myself wanting these characters to to come back again, even though I know it's kind of an out of continuity tale, uh, uh, or it pretty much has to be because of the ultimate fate of Lex Luthor. If you're to believe the ending, and uh, you know, but it's it's just such a it's such a feel good tale. But you know, sometimes the best stories are the ones that you really can't have a sequel. This doesn't need a sequel. It's it's perfect the way it is. It doesn't need. Yeah, I a, yeah, a, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I don't yeah. want this to be touched. It's perfect as a standalone. Yeah. But I just wonder if the popularity of this will mean, hey, we could sell a human target story in the main DC continuity. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, if uh, if the Supergirl movie does well and Tom King's doing the screenplay for that, I, I wonder if this will get any uh, attention uh from that audience, but, uh, probably not. I know they're very different. They're very different animals, but, uh, we'll see. Like, I'm, I'm really yeah. curious to see how, you know, everything's going to ride. Cause Tom King's had a rough go of it with his scripts. He's written like four and this is his fifth one. And he's, he's got the opportunity of his career to, uh, you know, hit it out of the park with a Supergirl movie script. So it's going to be interesting to see. I wish him all the luck in the world. If he captures just 10% of the, of, of his brilliance of Supergirl woman of tomorrow, uh, I'm going to be really looking forward to that movie. Yeah, it's so tough when you get, you know, movie studio executives' opinions involved because will they will they be able to use that flowery language that really helped? It was such an integral part of the story with yeah. something like Human Target. I guess you kind of sell, if you try to sell it, you, well, look at the success of look at how popular Mad Men was set kind of in that mod era. You got to set Human Target in that same type era, which would be so interesting to see yeah. the members of the Justice League International you know, set the, back then with kind of retro costumes or what have you. But anyway, we're going off the rails again, everybody. We'll let you go. Thanks for joining us as always. Uh, really appreciate it. If you're checking us out on the audio only podcast, which can be found anywhere podcasts can be found, just do a search for the comic source and subscribe. Uh, if you're listening there and you haven't gone over and subscribed to Rocky's channel and checked out uh, his YouTube content, I highly encourage you to do that. Just head over to YouTube, do a space for, do a search for comic space, boom, exclamation point. And you can see our smiling faces and see the books as we talk about them. Uh, you know what to do once you're there. Ring the notification bell, subscribe, like this video, leave comments. We really like to engage. So we appreciate you joining as always. And we'll talk to you next time. Catch you later.